soon. Mm. We've got a lot to talk about for Aquascape and Zan. Oh, dude, there's so much in here today. Uh, I can't wait to share this journey today. Uh, so, this is uh, 11 days of reefing. We're going through all the episodes uh, again, uh, 52 weeks of reefing. Uh, but bringing you up to episode 13 today, 10 through 13. Giving you all of the current evolution of the conversation uh, and yeah, 10 through 13 today. I think the core beliefs that we share in these are really resonating with people. There was uh, so many comments that were uh, like, you guys really should post the core beliefs. You guys, you really should do this. I said, oh, don't worry, it's coming. Yeah, and just break. Actually, we're going to start uploading them as individual chunks uh, later on, so yep. you'll see that uh, in a little bit. But today you're going to see uh, live rock, you're going to see aquascape stuff, you're going to see uh, live sand and ammonia. Not as simple as you think. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, as we're going to start here, yep. while we start with uh, uh, these things, with a Doyle Brunson quote, the wisdom that he has shared today, <laughs> we actually have two because they're two. kind of inverse. Yeah. All right, so the first quote of the day that's going to drive most of today's conversation is failure should be our teacher not our undertaker wow that's quoted powerful. doyle brunson powerful wisdom. yeah failure should not should be our teacher not our undertaker mm. uh and you hear this out of us a lot man yeah. because we take a lot of risks we take a lot of chances we explore new lounges, we get shot in the back as trailblazers all the time yeah we had that but we find new things man and we're excited about them we had that conversation a couple days ago in that episode we were talking about uh you know how much we actually enjoy failing just the like ah, it's exciting to fail you know, it's, it's, a lot of people shy away from it. It's but. funny, man, because we, you know, I got 12 tanks I've set up now. You know, we're testing biome and uh, cycling. You can you follow our like, yeah. channel if you want, or the Facebook group. Uh, uh, but the, the thing about it is, is like, so two of the fish died in one of them because uh, uh, of ammonia spike. And I saw some comments in there like, well, I'm not watching any of this now because uh, you guys already failed. If you killed two fish out of the 24, it's already done. Like, yeah. uh, I think you're missing the point, man. <laughs> uh, I think you're missing the point here totally. And, and what it happened is like a sponge died, man, and rotted in the tank oh, from yeah. the, you know, golf rock and it caused an ammonia spike. And, you know, tragically, I mean, we're using bread clownfish and the culls for a reason. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. like, I don't know, man. You can't look at those things a lot that way. All right. So Doyle Brunson also has the inverse <laughs> quote, right? Yep. Oh, well, you sure? Okay. Uh, he says, I know I'm fortunate to have played at this level, and I still win more often than I lose. That's uh. the nature of reefing, man, and, like, <laughs> and doing anything difficult that most people can't do. Yeah. You know, if reefing was easy, uh, dude, like, none of you guys would be special, I guess. Right? <laughs> we would uh, be special. Yeah, because, like, it's, you're taking a slice mm. of Fiji and you're growing it in your house, man, and you're doing it for many, many, many years. I like that. Uh, I really like that analogy of uh, having living people and things in space. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's a very, very hard thing to do. Keep people alive in a, an environment and provide everything they need for it. This isn't a hamster. It's not a goldfish. It's not even a dog or a cat, man. This is a rare and unique pet, man, that is challenging. And so when you have these two quotes that are inverse of each other, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Uh, let us know, man, if you uh, agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, I know that I'm fortunate to have played at this level and still win more than I lose. Are you happy with that? <laughs> Do you have to win every time? Uh, you know, I saw another quote recently, which is, uh, uh, if you're okay with being a loser, you're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> it's the absolute po uh, no, opposite. No, I, I think it, oh, I think it was. If uh, show me a person who's okay with being a loser, and I'll show you a loser. There it is. Yeah, that's uh, it. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. All these things are inverse uh, of all of our personality. So, but that will really be the highlight of uh, how we talk about t today's uh, stuff. So, uh, you know, again, decades of reefing, all into eleven episodes mm -hmm. today. We're going to do it. So what is next? What is the first episode we're going to talk about? Starting with episode 10, a uh, recap from the 52 weeks. That episode was called What You May Not Have Known About Live Rock. Very open-ended. 
man, do I know more about live rock than I did <laughs> today. And still, I don't know enough about live rock today. Yeah. Uh, the conversation has evolved so much. Uh, so this is our core belief, though. This is if, uh, if you want to, uh, if you share this one, listen up. If you don't, share it, check out, or maybe come along for the ride. Maybe we'll change your belief. Yeah. Uh, but core belief in relation to live rock. Rock choice will define your journey. Get the right tool for the right job. Mm. There isn't a best option for all applications here. If, if. Uh, if you think there is, I want to hear what you think is the best, like, for everything, for a new person, an advanced reefer, uh, every possible thing, you know, I'd aggressive reef. Challenge uh, that it doesn't exist. I don't think it exists either. No, so no. Uh, the rock choice here, I think, will define your journey, get the right tool for the right job, and we're going to share some of those things, starting uh, with what we believe matters most in relation to Live Rock. Live Rock. All right. First thing that we believe matters most is it, it's new. It's kind of a new concept, and that biome is the future. So, like, what is the makeup of, you know, you know how many times, especially, like, uh, you know, being a stickhead in this entire journey for me in the hobby, and just, uh, you know, it seems like there's a little extra challenge in, the, in, in keeping them for me. Um, but what I've always heard was, uh, you know, uh, of when somebody would have a, a, a whole bunch of frags or sticks or something like that, uh, fail, and but they were in the early phases of their tank, like six months or a year. There was uh, so much advice I got from uh, Sticks was uh, this unknown maturity of the tank. It was like your tank wasn't mature enough, and there was this conversation about maturity, which, you know, what is that supposed to mean? Like, I, I don't know what mature means. Does that mean I got to wait a year before I can put sticks in? Does that mean uh, I'm screwed from the get? Or, you know, can I, is there a way to, mature faster in my tank than they went before. Uh, and I actually think now that the definition of that maturity is this biome. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. I believe five years from now when everybody's talking about this, nobody will be talking about cycling a tank. They'll be talking about biome. Your biome. Tanks. Yeah. S establishing biome. Like mm. cycling the tank is a conversation of ammonia that we'll get to later. Yeah. Uh, but like a biome, man, is the things that prevent, you know, all the little competitive organisms in the tank that really s prevent any one of them from getting out of control. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, balance <clears throat> each other. And so the, the reason I think that we're able to evolve the conversation, it's kind of like ICP in the old days, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, like all of a sudden I have vision into an area of the tank I didn't have. You know, that, I, what you do with that is a different question. Right. But like. Now, with the PCR testing and DNA testing, I can get, not only does the tank not mature, but the data suggests it as well. Yeah, right. right. And so, mm -hmm. like, there's a, it's not necessarily I'm going to go do the PCR testing and say, oh, well, now I know what I need to solve. But, like, when we can test, especially in things like investigates here, when I can test it and say, oh, well, now I understand why what I'm seeing sucks, mm. right? Also, it, it can, you know, get to the bottom of the question of, like, does my tank have ick or velvet or whatever in it? Right. Yeah, well, yes, it does. It's present. <laughs> DNA in there is present. Uh, we don't have to have that conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you're going to see, you know, and... I'm really curious, actually, because if you're following the little updates I'm doing on Facebook, I'm trying to do one about every week so you can see the progression of those 12 tanks. Yeah. Is some of them are doing way better than others, and you'd be surprised which ones they are. Like, yeah. One of them I was really surprised by is it looks like the one that we just took the it was dry rock, dry sand. We just took the water, 100 percent of the water out of the 160 seems to be doing really well. It is, yeah, it's so yeah. interesting. And I wouldn't have thought, because you always hear, like, there's not a lot of stuff in the water. Yeah, well, on the opposite end of that, uh, some of the tanks that are being tested back there that, you know, you would think, like, like the, the bacteria or whatever, doesn't live in the water column, you hear that forever, and like, there's no, you know, this uh, uh, cycled water, and uh, you know, what does that even mean, is that it can be true? But then you go and look at the tank next to it, or two tanks down from that one, and you see, the actual sand and the rubble that came out, like where the bacteria are housed, that came out of uh, uh, like your 360 tank or some other tanks, and it doesn't look good. 
No, you it's can a, see. You can see garbage where it's come looking. from. Yeah. And the, it's going to ebb and flow, and we'll see. But, like, even some of the tanks that look really good right now. So right now, if you watch these things, in terms of biome, uh, don't mm. be surprised at the live rock. So we got the Indonesian rock from Route 66. Yep. We got the Gulf rock. We have uh, uh, the... Actually, you know, it's funny, in the last update, the real reef looked really good. In two days, man, it turned totally around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but those two live rocks look really good. And uh, the bio brick from one of them looks really good, or did look good for a while. But here's the problem, man. Also, the golf rock, also the yellowest from all the stuff that's decaying, has the most algae growth on the glass from all the nutrients, mm. has uh, gorilla cr crabs in it that kill the fish. Uh, the fish don't even go in the rock anymore because they're afraid of the crab. Uh, <laughs> it has a uh, uh, pest uh, anemones on it. Uh, the uh, brick from the 700 has pest anemones, bubble algae. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, I think the first one's going to end up with bryopsis in it. Oh, like the so. Coral only has bryopsis in it. Yeah. I, I th it looks to me like the the mm. one from the uh, what do you call it the, the Indonesian rock. So, like biome is not just just like some bacteria. It's so many things. You're going to see that in these PCR reports. So yep. check it out. Okay, so the next thing that we believe uh, matters most is uh, we're going to give some distinct advice here. Like, uh, you could debate this stuff. I'm looking for the 80-20s, the highest percentage paths, uh, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. But live rock is the highest percentage path uh, for 12-month path and best path for new reefers. So I if, uh, if you want to, uh, I could see this. Uh, if you, you, I think you said in your office when we were talking about this, uh, if your grandma were to come up to you and ask you, you know, what should I use? And I've never had a reef tank before. And what's going to, what am I going to have the least hard time with? It would be live rock. Establish live rock. Just, it's ready to go. Yeah, and, and and that's showing right now to be the case as well. Yeah, you're going to get up aptasia or mm -hmm. pest enemies. Yeah, you're going to get bubble algae. Yeah, you're going to get all these other things. But I'm also going to have a beautiful tank for the first 12 months. Right. You know, I'm going to like, get my feet wet. I'm going to be success. I'm not running into dinos. I'm not running all this garbage, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it again. Live rock, meaning rock that you got out of the ocean, from Indonesia, from Bali, from wherever, uh, the problem is, is all those places have shut down the amount of rock that's coming out of them mm. to a trickle. And they're now like, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 bucks a pound, which uh, if I want 100 pounds of rock, then I mean, it's for two grand. Wow. You know? So it's just some rock. <laughs> but is it easier? Yeah. yeah. So the second question is, is can I get live rock from an established tank? So far, it looks like, yeah, but you're also going to get all the things that might have been in the tank, like algae and other mm. things, too. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think that would be best probably done. Like when you see it at WWC, that was big vats of live rock, yeah. uh, and they're sitting at the end of the systems, not necessarily in light. It's, and so, like, you're getting all that biome, but you're not, like, all the photosynthetic garbage isn't uh, in there. Yeah. It's really cycling for a really long period of time. So... Yeah, but if you're asking me from uh, the first 12 months, I just want to be successful. I just want to have a, a really nice tank. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to crash it or come up with so many challenges that I end up pulling my hair out and, you know, this hobby was not for me. Screw After this. eating flatworms and little red bugs are not a concern for your first 12 months for most people. Yeah. Like, they probably aren't even doing SPS corals in that case. Like, uh, mm. and Aptasia can be beat or at least fought back. Actual live rock, probably the best. Mm. What about the next one? Uh, next one is uh, purple rock is a higher percentage path for new reefers also. So that uh, instant, it's almost like instant tank look because you know, when we did the five, when you did the five minute guide, when we pulled, you know, real reef rock, took it out, put it in the tank, filled it up, put corals in it. That all happened in like a day or, uh, or two days. And uh, guess what? Turned out all right. You know, and I, it wasn't bone white, nasty, uh, covered in brown over the like we turned the lights on. And even after a week, after two weeks, those tanks still look good. I was in the lab, like ex inspecting the rocks yesterday. Mm. Uh, and 
I was looking at the real reef one. It's, you know, purple rock that's been soaking for months in some vat somewhere. Yeah. I'd love to go there and see how this works. <laughs> but uh, it's an artificial rock. And uh, we saw little specks of brown in the sand, and that has since, like, immediately taken over the whole sand. Yeah. But here's the, the funny part is if you look really close, that brown crud is actually on the rock as well. You just can't see it <laughs> because the purple hides it. And so there's like this brown film that grows over something white like a reef saber and I can see it really easy. Even just like a, a really thin brown film I can see, but a thin brown film on purple rock I can't see. And here's the thing is like in a matter of uh, weeks to months, it's all going to go away anyway. Mm -hmm. So if as a new reefer it's there but I don't know it because I don't know what to look for and it just like comes and goes and I never even saw it, boom, that's yeah. a win. You know, I, I actually had an interesting conversation with uh, Elliot at Marine Collectors the uh, other day. You were there actually for that conversation. Oh, with the fish, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, well, so should you just watch the fish when you put it in? And he's like, well, part of me wants to tell you to not even look at the tank for two days. Like, put the thing in and then come back in two days and see what happened? Yeah, because reefers are like so finicky. If it doesn't eat in the first three seconds, they're like, they want to capture it and like put a funnel in its mouth and feed it. <laughs> if it's like looking a little funny, it's capture it and like, you just keep doing doing these things that cause more and more and more stress and yeah. like, you know, like if I have, you know, a little bit of brown in there, it's like, oh, maybe I need some chemi clean up. Maybe I need yeah. some carbon. Maybe I need some you know, lanthanum chloride. Brushing maybe I need some yeah, like yeah. a mad scientist. And if, if, if for a new brand new reefer, if the purple rock just hides the brown film, they don't even know it and they just cycle back through it. Like ignorance is bliss in this case, <laughs> you know. True. So I agree with like I this. I did that. I mean, in the uh, the BRS, you know, on the Ask BRS community uh, Facebook group, and even uh, as a new reefer and stuff like that, I've uh, answered some of those. So many times, you see the question pop up uh, with, oh, "It's my first tank. It's brand new. I use dry rock. It's white," uh, and then all of a sudden, there's this. What's this weird brown spot? What's this brown spot? What's that green spot? What is this big spot? And uh, you know, like you said, a lot of times it's just it's like diatoms or something that you just really you know don't need to con overly concern yourself about and like tear down the tank and brush every nook and cranny and uh, water change until the brown is gone. And a hundred percent, like purple rock, you don't even see it. It's not even a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. It's true. All right. So next one though. Pest-free, dry, sterile-ish rock mm. uh, or aquaculture dry rock is the best for your forever tank. Higher or, path of success. I'm going to say forever tank or for an, an experienced reefer who wants to have five, six, seven years. And again, like you can have any, everybody's had success with, I mean, you could put potatoes in the tank and somebody had success with it. But <laughs> like... I'm talking high percentage pass, like I'm into this for five years, I'm looking back and say, yeah, I did the right thing. Yep. Not that the first 12 months are a little harder than others. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in this case, like I don't want to, I want to have as few pests in this as possible. I don't want to introduce uh, ick from the uh, bat of water from uh, the fish store that, you know, brought in the live rock. Mm. For that reason I probably would get live rock in a box rather than in uh, uh, bats of water. Because, I mean, to be frank, man, in that environment, probably that water has every disease known to man because they can't put copper in the live rock. And if there's ever been fish in there, it's going to have that in there somewhere. Yeah. So I, uh, I think that inherently when, when you think of, uh, we, we say it's best for your forever tank, uh, to me that means, in the back of my mind, that means... Uh, if I'm planning a forever tank, I've already been, this isn't my first rodeo. You know? yeah. I'm not planning my forever tank as a brand new reefer, first getting into the hobby. And there's probably, I mean, there's, a, uh, there's some people out there that, there some, that, yeah. that falls into, but uh, like, uh, if, I, if you were gonna uh, categorize a major, uh, the majority, uh, you're planning your forever tank is uh, not your first rodeo. So those, all those little brown spots and everything that you fight with that, that sterile bone white rock, uh, you already know how to battle, and you know what the other side of it looks like. And you just don't even care. Yeah. It'll just go away uh, on its own. It'll eventually work itself out. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so, but I don't want, 
acre eating flatworms. I don't want uh, uh, you know parasitic copepods. I don't want uh, you know all the vibrios. I don't want mm. uh, uh, like we had some kind of black little speck. I don't know what it even was that like wiped out a, oh, yeah. a whole SPS tank here. And a whole I don't bunch even know what it was. Yeah. 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 And so I don't want all of these things. I don't want aptasia. I don't want bubble algae. Those things can be beat to some degree. But I, I like, just don't want to be constantly fighting this stuff. And some of this stuff will be introduced mm. no matter what. But in really small quantities, and I can fight it, and I'll probably only have to deal with half of them rather than all of them. Yeah. Uh, and especially, you know, if you're really setting up like a dream style forever tank, like, my re recent experience is, is here. I mean, we're able to fight them back, but there's acro eating flatworms in this tank. There and is. still, you know, we use a series of KZ products the flatworm stop, the coral booster. We blow off uh, the adults and Got we put in, in some yeah. uh, wrasses in there that tend to eat them, that file fish eats them. Loves them. Yeah, and so we did some things to like maintain uh, or uh, uh, to manage, manage the, the mm. fact that they're in there. But I'd like to just not have them in there to begin with. I wish that wasn't a thing that we have to manage from now on. Yeah. So most of the time, if you get aquacultured frags from uh, SPS frags from a you know a reputable place, you probably won't get acri and frack worms in your tank because mm -hmm. if they had them, they wouldn't be able to farm them. And in yeah. most cases, yeah. anyway. Mm. Uh, and so also though, like I think, you know, if I set up another. If I set up another LPS, because you can't really aquaculture LPS as easy, you know, right. like if I wanted it like a torch, dream torch tank, kind of like the one I set up in my house. Mm -hmm. Well, I had problems with like brown jelly disease and like now there's hundreds of these corals and it's really hard to like solve it all afterward. Yeah. So I think if I was going to do a wild caught tank, uh, I would put like a, with with euphilia, I would treat really aggressively for brown jelly degree disease. And I probably would set up a small little frag tank, kind of like, what was that, advanced acrylics or something? Yeah, yeah the one that we uh, put with the I need a fancy system, just a small little system where I can put those frags I got, let them sit in there for, you know, a month or two, make sure that uh, they look healthy, they're staying healthy, they're not affecting anything else, and then move them into the tank. But I don't want to take that stuff from live rock and you know put brown jelly disease into the tank and then like have to go break out every last one of the affiliate out there as it's kind of chewing through one through them one at yeah, a time. Yeah. And I want to do better. So if you're setting up a forever tank, sterilish, uh, uh, pest-free dry rock is probably the best. So that's kind of gets to that core belief. Right rock choice will define your journey. You know, pests versus ease of use versus yeah. does it look good right day one? Does it look good in the end? Also, even things like defining your journey in terms of the HNSA. Uh, like I built this really elaborate aquascape. I, you know, I was going to say you can't do that with Fiji, but we watched Brent actually do it. I wish he had a photo. Oh of yeah, it. he did. Uh, he, you know like, what? I'll, I'll ask Brent. And I'll put it up on my Facebook, uh, and we'll we'll throw it up on uh, uh, the the community tab of YouTube as well. Uh, but yeah, you, there's certain types of rock that I can actually break apart and rebuild into something and that I really want to build that speaks to my heart. And I don't care that it's going to look a little brown in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I care about where I'm going, not necessarily the first step of the journey. Hmm. Next one. Uh, another thing that we believe matters most when it comes to live rock is uh, don't turn the lights on to 350 par day one. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's kind of some. Uh, it wasn't day one that we did it on the 750, uh, but there was a from that thing from uh, Josh just says, you know what, turn the lights on and embrace the brown town, embrace the suck. So I would say if you're using live rock, it's a little closer or really really established rock. Mm. It's less important that you hedge your hedge your bets, yeah. right? Uh, they turn it on 350, you know, and if it goes south, man, just turn them off and start yeah, over. And you could turn them on to 100. Yeah, you can just. It doesn't like, have to be max 350. Yeah, if you're at 350 and it's just not going the way you want, you can turn it back down to 100. You can just actually just turn the lights down to zero, let the photosynthetic garbage uh, dissipate over the week and start again. A gradual burn them yeah. back up. Uh, but, like, for me, I think if I had to give advice to somebody that was counting on me, I would say. 
start by turning the lights on to something in the LPS range, you know, between 50, 150, probably lower. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let it go that way. Just enjoy the fish that are in there for a month, you know, and add some fish that are interesting to you so, you know, you can, you know, connect with your pets and just make sure it doesn't, like, get out of hand before you raise the lights up. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, start at 50, kind of raise it up to, you know, 100, 150. And, and if you're seeing success, then let it go. So that's actually what I'm doing in my office right now is uh, for the first couple of weeks when I moved the tank over here, I got the fish in, I got new sand, I got the rock uh, for the 360. And so what I'm doing is I turned the Kessels on originally just because I want to enjoy the fish. Now, a week ago, I turned uh, the skies on mm -hmm. uh, to about 10%. And I'm going to keep raising it up until I get uh, every week or so until I get into the SPS zone. Once I'm in that zone, and I don't have any problems. And right now it's looking spectacular. Mm -hmm. So once I get in that zone, I don't have any problems. Well, test SPS frags. And then when those do well, uh, it's time to just fill the tank. You know? It would be an interesting next experiment on the uh, in the 12 test tanks in the back is uh, this tank starts with light 100% day one. This thing starts with light at 50% uh, day one, and each of them are on like this gradual increase scale, and just kind of see what happens. So the, the nature of it is, is without the light, all of the biome that's in the tank is essentially consuming some kind of nutrient, whether it's pulling it out of the water, or it's fine decaying material, whatever it is, it's getting its energy from finding it and consuming it, yeah. right? Whereas once you turn the lights on, there's all of this energy that comes from uh, the uh, lights, the photosynthetic energy. There's mm -hmm. like this kind of infinite amount of, not infinite, but a, like really it's high degree of fuel. air, yeah. of fuel. And then if I go from 50 to 350, man, there's seven times as much as fuel. fuel on. <laughs> uh, and it might fuel some things really, really rapidly. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I think about that. If somebody is asking me for advice, don't turn the lights on to 350 par the first day and expect high percentage success unless you got unbelievably established rock. Yeah. All right, next one. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, ammonia is more about live rock than dry. Okay, so this is one of those experiments that we like never got around to shooting the video for. <laughs> we probably oh, should. Yeah, we're watching. Uh, we tested uh, uh, like uh, the cycling some uh, tanks with clownfish. Right. Fish. Fishless cycle or clown or fish cycle or you know uh, bacterial with ammonia uh, like you, yeah, you we tried dose a bunch ammonia. Of There's a bunch of stuff. So here's the thing is we never saw an ammonia spike <clears> in <throat> these dry rock tanks. These are E170s. We threw two clownfish in and started feeding it. And we never really saw any ammonia in any of them, hmm. right? And we're like to the point where we're like, what is going on? We're testing, you know, with uh, the Hawk. We're testing with the Hobby Kit. And we're just not seeing any ammonia in these dry, sterile tanks, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we're like, all right, well, let's kick it in the butt and add eight clownfish. <laughs> and we still didn't see any ammonia from these things. Now, recently though, uh, we put live rock in some tanks uh, as part of our cycle biome test and ammonia skyrockets on the uh, hmm. two live rock ones because they have decaying organic material on them. Hmm. And I couldn't help but wonder from that moment, is all of this conversation about ammonia not about the fish and the food that we add to the tank? Because maybe that's manageable, as long as you're not dumping tons and tons of food or tons of fish day one. But if like people who cycle a tank with two clownfish have really high success rates, yeah. uh, well, maybe it's just because it's so little amount of ammonia that the tank actually builds it up in real time almost like because mm. it never gets to the measurable amount in a test kit but if i used live rock like this is the stuff that we all grew up on uh mm. fiji rock that sat in a box it was in a boat for a month and then stored somewhere shipped somewhere like it was been out of the ocean for two months man wrapped yeah. in no newspaper stuff i put that in there all kinds of stuff is dying and turning into ammonia. But dry still rock, in, think, about, think about 100 pounds of rock that I put into the tank that has been sitting in a Fiji box for two months versus a couple of clownfish 
eating a couple pellets of fish food that I feed him every day. Mm -hmm. Totally not relevant to each other at all. So I think we're going to go dig back into that uh, experiment. Maybe we'll even repeat it. But, like, I it would not be surprised to find out if this statement was true. And what I currently believe is ammonia and cycling your tank, as long as you do it with a reasonable amount of fish, is actually more about live rock and all the decaying organics on the rock than it is about the two little fish you dropped in. Interesting. No, no, no. Uh, the next one, we believe it matters most. We should stop referring to the nitrogen cycle uh, when we talk about cycling dry rock. Why is that? Well, uh, when you talk about cycling, like it, if you're talking about the nitrogen cycle and you refer to it as a nitrogen cycle, so mm -hmm. be it. Like that's really, I guess it's, you know, you're, you're making sure that toxic ammonia is in the tank. But like, as we just discussed, it's like so easy, almost like you could do almost nothing and it will happen. Right? Yeah. And like, and, and nothing also is uh, nothing. I just put the live rock in, in a month from now, it will be done too. Like, there's not really a lot you're going to do or not do about that. It's just kind of telling you when to add your fish, mm -hmm. right? But as we talk about today's cycle, what we're really talking about is we're getting all of the biome, all the different types of bacteria and everything in there ready to put life in the tank. Uh, Not just that there's so toxic ammonia won't support life for so fish. So many yeah. other things. Yeah. Support, like the maturity for SPS, right? Like, what is that magic number? Or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> uh, and I, I just think that it's not helpful at this point. We've evolved past it. And hopefully five years from now, when we say the word cycle, everyone that's listening knows that it really isn't referring to the nitrogen cycle anymore. It's a much bigger picture. I could see that happening. All right. Uh, I will say the next one here okay. is uh, UV will prevent some opportunistic pets from winning the photosynthetic battle. Yeah, well, this one we found out uh, uh, on the 750. Yeah, every time we've plugged in UV now on different tanks, 750 was one of the biggest ones, where bare bottom tank, brand new, lights are on, we're embracing the brown, and bacteria bloom. All right, let's put a UV sterilizer off to the side, bacteria bloom gone. Uh, all right, 750 now has dinos. Uh, let's put the UV sterilizer back on and black it out. Gone. Mm -hmm. uh, done. And so uh, you think about when you're starting the tank, um, and some of these opportunistic pests like dinos and maybe it's in cyano and things like that, uh, bacterial blooms. Uh, UV sterilizer is more than just, a, you know, at this point, it's not just a tool for uh, managing the ick uh, in your fish or managing disease in your fish. It can actually help with the tank as a whole. Yeah, we thought about this uh, originally. Uh, like when I started the hobby, it was all related to like fish parasite and stuff. Now this is a super common tool to either avoid altogether or treat uh, ongoing issues like bacterial blooms or dinos or all those other things that many of them are photosynthetic, right? And so like dinos that you'll know whether or not, for the most part, whether or not UV will help solve this problem for you because at night they actually dissipate and go away uh, into the water column, right? And then mm. they fill, uh, the lights come back on and they form these clusters again. Well, if they do that and they go back in the water column at night, they're photosynthetic organism that's in the water, we could sterilize all and they'll stop replicating tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and so the problem like goes away almost instantly mm. from something that is very difficult to disrupt in any other manner. And so, uh, just a solution to a really difficult problem that many people have. So UV, especially uh, if you're using dry rock, in many cases will prevent some opportunistic pets from winning. And you know those, uh, we, what we did actually on the 750 was add in the hang, not a hang on the back, we kind of made a hang on the back essentially. Yeah, I just piped a, a pump down over the side, through a UV sterilizer, and back over the edge. Yeah, so like we didn't install the UV permanently. We just tried to solve the, today's problem, right? So threw the mm -hmm. pump over the edge, just dangle it in the tank, and then have it go back in and solve the problem, take it off, and you're done. If you ever need it and have the problem again. And that one kind of ebbed and flowed, and finally we just installed it permanently. <laughs> but for, uh, <laughs> and then problem's gone permanently as well. Yeah. Uh, but like we were talking about it actually in the, uh, uh, yesterday about the, They'll hang on the back ones now. Oh, the UV, right? yeah, aqua UV. Generally speaking, I wouldn't use those for 
protecting my fish unless it was a really small system because it probably isn't going to have the right contact time. Mm -hmm. But uh, to solve something like a bacterial bloom or a, a, a dino issue, perfect, man. Hang it on the back, get it going, mm. solve your problem, turn it off and yeah. put it away. Mm. You know, it's just a tool to be able to solve it and really easy to do. If you're having those kind of problems today, I could order one of these things. I could solve my problem by next weekend and be done. You know, like why am I keep fighting these problems? Yeah. You know, so uh, there you go. Kind of hit this next one already. Uh, but if you have problems, turn the lights off. It's a reset button. Uh, especially uh, all of the stuff that starts to grow after you turn your lights on, meaning that they're all photosynthetic uh, pests and problems. Stop fueling them. Turn yeah. it off. This doesn't really apply probably to a lot of the people that use live rock and you're on a different journey. But if you're using today's dry rock, which is what most people, 90% of people will use, yeah. if you're running into a problem, then uh, you know what? Just turn the lights off or way down and you will probably alleviate that problem. If you don't have corals in there, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> you, you actually then even turn the lights on only to the period that you're actually home. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, and like that might even be a generally good idea anyway to prevent like algae and stuff growing around the glass. Oh, like, yeah. You know, the fish don't necessarily need that light in many cases. So like, or it could ebb and flow. It, does, it could be on during the day, but at 10 percent, you know, yeah. and a little different for your, your viewing pleasure later. So if you're having those problems, don't be afraid to just turn the damn lights off, man. <laughs> and, and like, that's why you don't put corals in in many cases immediately mm. is because it gives you that tool and the ability to just hit a reset button without worrying about yeah. a lot. Yeah. This next one was uh, WWC from the, you know, we talked about mentors yesterday and Josh being one of the mentors there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one of the th lessons that we learned from WWC was utilitarian fish and using them as like your, uh, the fish are a better cleanup crew than... Uh, when somebody says clean up crew, crew to you, what do you think? Uh, and for me, it's snails, crabs, uh, red legs, blue legs, trochus, all these different types of snails and crabs and whatnot, uh, urchins maybe. Uh, but actually, your bigger cleanup crew, the more effective cleanup crew is the, the fish that you choose to put in there, specifically tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Josh uh, says you. Uh, the thing we believe the most here is tangs are, tangs are the solution to fighting algae on new rock. We've seen it time and time again. We were doing uh, UV sterilizer experiments where there was a tang in there and the tangs were eating, eating up a majority of the algae on some of those experiments. But uh, any other tank that we've started uh, around here, throw in a tang. And there you go. The fish are able to swim around and grab it everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. they'll grab it in the glass, they'll grab it everywhere. So and it's uh, their job. That's, I mean, that's what their intent, the natural behavior is to constantly pick at rocks to and eat algae. Well, there you go. Why wouldn't you put that in your tank as a tool? Yeah. Like, so your yellow tangs, your purple tangs, your uh, bristle tooth tanks, uh, the white tail tanks, all those things are going to change the trajectory of your tank, especially in the beginning. Uh, so if your tank, your rock has algae on it, so be it. Mm. Uh, okay, I, I said this one earlier too. I prefer boxed rock out of water uh, versus uh, over what rock that's in a holding bin at a store. Mm. Uh, you know, and that one's probably controversial a little bit, but like if I were going to get live rock, I don't want it in a system that's been exposed to, I want it to be exposed to as few pests as possible. So, you know, like judge that for yourself or like stores are all different. When you go to that store and it looks like it's probably been exposed to everything known to man, it probably has. Mm. If they have shown you the lengths that they've gone to make sure it isn't exposed, then hey, that's probably one of the best places to buy it. Uh, but I don't want to buy live rock that I know that like, literally has been exposed to every last disease known to man mm. in that system and it hasn't been ever shut down in 10 years <laughs> you know so uh you know consider that as you know your different destinations uh believe matters most about live rock here uh, another one is purple looks best day one and hides mistakes like the second time we said it and it actually it's true like we've found this in the five minute guide so the Real reef rock is probably the best example of that. Uh, this yeah. one actually here too. That was this like Walt, Walt Smith, Smith 2.0. Yeah, I don't think they, we sell that anymore. But uh, the real reef one, it does cost more. It's man-made. It's uh, you know like 
turned purple. So mm -hmm. it is more work than just collecting some rock off the ground. <laughs> uh, you know, it's mining some rock out of Florida. It is more work to produce and it has a cost to it, but that cost can actually result in a much more pleasurable first year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, decide for yourself which one of those things is most important. And one of the things I think we're gonna find here too is when, this is actually ties into something we said earlier, like the tank that has just the water out of the 360 in it, dry sand, dry rock, and the experiment tank that we have mm -hmm. uh, is doing really well, like makes me believe in biome in a bottle more than ever. So yeah. like, I don't know, we're gonna, the next evolution of these experiments is we'll go back and like look at all the commercially available biome in a bottle, different bacteria you can mm. dose and stuff. Uh, we'll test them both visually, but also with to, the PCR yeah, testing. Yeah, send it to the PCR. That's a, the, I can't wait for the PCR test results for all of these different tanks just to like put them all up on the wall and go, huh, and draw a whole bunch of conclusions. So the reason that we're doing all these experiments is because this is a piece that I feel like we haven't as a hobby identified yet, which is how do I get the best of both worlds? Mm -hmm. How do I get the dry, sterile rock that I can work with and aquascape really well without, you know, like I can't aquascape wet rock, it'll just dry out and then the whole purpose is gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? yeah. Or like I can't do really elaborate aquascape. So. Yeah, you can't do an HNSA with it. Yeah, yeah. so uh, how do I do that? How do I avoid the pest? But how do I not also run into all those problems? Well, it's, I. I guarantee out of these 12 different methods, a mm. couple of them are gonna pop out as the best. And then when we go to the like biome in a bottle stuff, and then we can kind of combine the different mm. methods into one. I'm pretty certain that we're gonna find the, if you did it this way, 95% of people would have a flawless first year. We would end up coming back to this episode and changing what we believe matters most and getting rid of the live rocks, the highest percentage path for new reefers, 12 month plan. Purple rocks, the higher percentage path of new reefers. Pest free dry rock is the uh, best for, or is the best plan for your forever tank. Uh, if we, get, if we can come in through and say, you know, expand the conversation about biome and how important it is and then find the solution to biome where it doesn't matter what rock I choose, uh, sp specifically the, the pest-free dry rock, uh, if I add this biome in a bottle or I diversify my biome from day one, no problems. Okay. Or very, very little problems. So some hard lessons in relation to what you might not have known about live rock. Uh, starting with the first one. I personally didn't believe in copepods. It's just something uh, that just showed up on its own and not gonna do anything about it. You know, and we're all jaded by our experiences, right? So like my first experience was this golf rock and there was like, I could put a flashlight out and balls of copepods would follow it around at night. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many. <laughs> and, and so like, like, and I know that you can't really even prevent the copepods from coming in. In fact, I saw a salt test many years ago that Eric Bornman did. They autoclaved the tanks and mm -hmm. somehow copepods still made it in just from the salt mix. And like they found <laughs> copepods in these tanks. Like, and then I sat through a seminar at one of the IMAX and uh, mm. one of the people that sells copepods for a living, uh, they, somebody stood up in the crowd and was like, asked a question, is like, you know, don't you feel like a little shame for selling copepods because these things will just populate in your tank on their own? And she literally stood there and said, I sell these things because people will buy them. <laughs> and I was appalled. <laughs> and I'm like, you should be so ashamed of yeah. what, and I can't believe at least you owned it, I guess. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but you say you, but the you said you didn't believe in them. Does that mean you have changed your ways? I have changed my belief structure mm. now. Is that like I think that it's true that the copepods will replicate on their own, especially in a world where ninety percent of us back then were using live rock. They're coming on the live rock, and they were going to populate no mm -hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. They're still going to come on your uh, frag corals. Uh, corals and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, the frags, uh, they're going to find their way into the tank. I don't think you could prevent copepods from entering your tank even if you wanted to. Yeah. So that was the way I thought about it before, but now I'm thinking about desirable. it is desirable in the beginning. Mm. Like so the question is still when do you add them? But like in the beginning because I feel like copepods now 
are actually part of the cleanup crew. Mm -hmm. Tiny little microscopic little uh, guys are running around eating organics off of the rock all day long, Something, the same way that the tangs do. Yeah, your tangs can't, uh, so they can get to places and uh, size of materials that uh, nothing else in your tank can. Mm -hmm. uh, even a snail, you think about a snail and uh, it's limited in its mobility because it gets stuck in crevices and they can't get deep inside. But these little copepods, that's where exactly where they live. The copepods are going to, like their population is going to be based on two things. The amount of food that's available, mm -hmm. meaning the amount of organics that are growing on your rock surface, uh, as well as predators. And if you don't have a mandarin or like certain types of wrasses, mm, a lot of times there's... And, yeah. I mean, a copepod, like people often think of it as like an amphipod, which is like a little teeny shrimp that you can look at. Uh, the best way you can see a copepod is go look at your glass and look at all the little white specks. And once in a while, one of them will they jump. move. Yep. It'll just jump a little <laughs> bit. And it's like a little microscopic jack, a uh, yep. uh, ball that you can barely see. These things are actually living all over the surface of your uh, rock work, eating the organics off. And so, like now, I think that you should can find a way to interject these things as part of the biome up front. Yeah. Right? Mm. And so the question is when? And I don't think it's actually the first day you set up the tank because there's actually no food for them then. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing growing on this rock surface, so the ones you add will probably all just die. So when brown town starts coming? Well, I, what I'm thinking is, like, you run the tank, you know, for some period of time. You got your fish in there. You've been feeding the corals. There's probably some little slime coat or something that's starting to grow on the rock. Mm. Uh, and then the answer is, should I put the copepods in before I turn the lights on? or like really quickly right after when definitely when the photosynthetic light, uh, energy comes in, all of a sudden there'll be stuff on the rock for sure. Mm. And it's a chicken and the egg that I'm not 100% sure on yet, but if uh, like my grandma asked me, man, should I add copepods? I'm gonna get past uh, like all the stuff that I felt before with dry rock specifically. I think getting a, like a booster population mm -hmm. of this stuff, especially if I'm not going to add corals immediately, will help increase the, the, the percentage rates of success for anybody who does it. Mm. So uh, LG Barn sells those little bottles uh, yeah, of the things. They have different, all different types too. Tisbees and they've got like the 550 blend and all this other stuff, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be a hard lesson for me. Eat some crow, <laughs> learn some lessons from these things and Yes, every tank will eventually get them, but sp so a live rock, I definitely wouldn't add them. Dry rock, biome, easy path to cycling, probably worthwhile. Dump some copepods in there, see what happens. Yep. Uh, another hard lesson learned uh, in live rock is that all pests with various degrees of life, of all life. the pests. So there's various degrees of live rock. Oh, so okay. like there's live rock, like real reef. Well, you know what? There is a definitely... There's algae on there. Yeah, there's a algae growing on there. I've seen it. You can, I mean, it's just visualable when you unpack it in some cases, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, uh, exactly. When I unpack the Indonesian rock, uh, there's definitely, like, algae on there. Mm -hmm. It looks like brassis to me. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll know probably in a matter of a couple of weeks as it grows a little lot larger. Definitely uh, in the other type of live, in the other live the rock. The golf rock, no, various Gorilla degrees. crabs and all, oh, uh, aptasias that are in there and whatnot. Yeah, ocean aptasias, they look different. Yeah, I mean, this is live, this is rock that has been pulled out and shipped to you in a bag of water, you know? Yeah. And so for me, when I got mine the first time, Man, I had bristle worms that were as big around as my pinky and this long, man, living inside of the sponges. I had eight million gorilla crabs to the point where I stopped trying to take them out. There was mantis shrimp everywhere. Mm. Uh, and to be honest, I wish I would have just left the mantis shrimp alone. They were tiny. And they say you can break glass or something. I don't know. They never bothered their glass. They were just cool. <laughs> uh, but there were... Uh, uh, what not parasitic copepods, but the ones that attach to your fish. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm spacing their name, but they're like they look like little millipedes that yeah, attach gosh, to the, the fish. Uh, Somebody will know. Somebody will know. Uh, there were uh, all kinds of. There was in the beginning. I've never seen this again in my whole life. The first day that we put it in there, we saw, I walked up and saw it at night with a flashlight, and the centipede looking thing ran through <laughs> the tank. And they're like, what the hell is that? That's why man? I want live rocks. So and I bad. never saw it again, right? Uh, well, like, wow, well, 
cool, but also the sheer volume of pests. So, you know, think about the different stages of pests. So if I had live rock that came out of the ocean in bags of water, everything's game. Every mm -hmm. disease, every mm -hmm. centipede, every, I mean, I don't even know what the hell that thing was called. <laughs> isopods and whatnot. Iso oh yeah, yeah. isopods, parasitic mm -hmm. isopods. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like I had those on my fish, by the way. They would attach to them during the day and then they'd fall off at night. Mm. Uh, came from the rock, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, when, when you think about it that way, and then you think about, uh, okay, well, I got it from the fish store. Well, the fish store has whatever was in the fish store's water. Yep. Probably not as bad as, uh, they're you're not going to get 8 million gorilla crabs and, and, and uh, you know. Uh, no, but various algaes, dinoflagellates, yeah. uh, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Okay, now rock that is basically dry in a box, whether it be Indonesian or real reef wrapped in newspaper, it's probably been sitting there for two months that mm. way. Well, gorilla crabs off the table, mantis shrimps off the table, isopods are probably off the table, ick and velvet are probably off the table, but algae will make that trap. Yeah, right? Right. so you pick the less of the evils if you want to go down that path, right? Yeah, so like a lot of people are like, oh, more, 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 more life. Well, yeah, more, 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 more pests. Thanks. And it's like that, the pendulum that swings back and forth. Yeah. Decide what matters to you and pick the thing that matters, right? Okay, the next one, hard lessons. And this one, like when I started, nobody ever talked about dinos. Wasn't yeah. even on the radar. Mm, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember it either. It was all like GHA and your standard hair algaes and all this other Bryopsis stuff. Bryopsis was a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, dinos are like an ongoing thing for a lot of people. It is a lot of people's problem. Right. And, and I wish it shows up out of thin air, it feels. By the way, we have a five minute guide on beating dinos. If anybody watched that, you would beat it, it'd be done. Uh, you know, like there's some things you need to do, but if you did them instead of, and it, this is kind of that piecemeal reefing, if I like search for all the things and here's all the answers, well, the, here's the two easy ones I really want to do. Well, don't be surprised when those don't work. Yeah. If you really think about it and approach it uh, holistically, you will solve it. Mm. And is it a little bit more work? No, it's easier because you can do it right away instead of have this prolonged problem o over months and like, you know, punching yourself in the face every day. This uh, dino conversation is really where a lot of this biome conversation comes mm -hmm. from because these are, uh, you know, they're, they're competing organisms. And uh, if, if your biome or whatever the balanced reef tank biome looks like uh, is out of balance and dinos is, uh, has a higher population, guess what's going to win? Dinos is going to end up taking over the tank and more and more tanks are experiencing dinos, meaning that the problem isn't, uh, uh, problem seems to be that we're, uh, the biome, in everybody's tank is the issue, not uh, you know, where, where are the dinos coming from. It's not like a magic uh, affliction to the entire hobby all of a sudden is now dinos. It's basically but, all this stuff lives on a surface, right? Yeah. Some of it breaks up at night, but like uh, during the day, all this stuff lives on a surface. And they're all competing for habitat. You know, they're competing for a little square of the, the reef. And the things that actually have to go hunt down organics to eat uh, usually lose to the things that can replicate very quickly uh, from photosynthesis. And you watch, if you're like, hey, dude, it doesn't even exist in the tank in the morning. By the end of the day, it's total slime coat. Well, mm. you can see how fast these things replicate yeah. by the hour, you know? Yeah. And in minutes, in many cases, uh, they can reproduce themselves. So, uh, you know, I think that dinos are a part of the whole thing of having the sterile type tank. And that's part of the reason why people use things like uh, Microbacter 7 and whatever. And you're boosting the, you know, competitive organisms in the tank to beat that one back that is very opportunistic. Mm. The dinos are very, very opportunistic to having available habitat, having no competitors for it, and then this like influx of all of this energy from the light. Mm. So, uh, you know, hard lesson there is, you know, just beat those things by thinking about biome and probably in most cases, if you put preventative uh, with a UV sterilizer on the beginning, there's a really good chance you'd never even run it. <laughs> you never even know what everybody's problem is. And then watch the five minute guide episode to help you out. All right, so another hard lesson. Live rock is expensive and it absolutely is. It, I don't know how, I guess uh, live rock really wasn't too much of an option and, and not uh, a very super popular thing when I first started, but your time frame it was. You know what? 
people don't want to pay for different options, and I don't blame them, blame them because partially we haven't really like, you know, educated the masses as to what you're actually getting, mm -hmm. you know, for your money. And so people talk to me all the time, like, hey, do you think I should set up a live rock farm, you know, with pre-cycled rock? And I'm like, yeah, dude, that would be a great service, you yeah. know, to the community. Yeah. If you had rock that was as cycled as all that stuff that's sitting in the back of WWC's uh, bins, mm -hmm. right? You know, one year plus live rock that has never seen a fish uh, that uh, like uh, definitely doesn't have any of those parasites. No lights, definitely yeah. had, has never seen a coral, so there's no acar eating flatworms. There's no little red bugs. Mm. There's no uh, bryopsis. There's no you know aptasia. There's none of that stuff, uh, and has all the right biome. You know maybe even tested by PCR. Mm -hmm. and they're like, all right. Well, that, man, is super, super valuable. And I actually want that more than I want the live rock that comes out of the ocean. Then, uh, then you have to explain why the value is so worth, like, the price. Like, uh, that's the nature of it, is setting up, like, setting up a farm like that and then paying people to operate it is more expensive than most people think. You just think like, oh, you're just gonna throw some rock in a bin. Like, yeah, I got a horse some, trough and uh, throw some rock in there with some power heads and good to go. Yeah, well, if that's the standard of quality, then sure. Uh, <laughs> but like, also there's people that actually work there every day and take mm -hmm. care of the stuff. And mm -hmm. so, so I don't know, it'll be interesting to see. I've, I've heard a lot of people discussing this one, but I, I'm, if it's not five years, it's definitely 10 years from now. That will be the number one. Dry rock will probably be old news. Live rock out of the ocean, for sure, will be totally turned off, mm -hmm. old news. Man-made rock uh, may be a combination of this whole thing. Uh, but I think that cycled rock, and you'll have to be prepared for the fact that it won't be $3 a pound. Oh, It'll yeah. probably be 10 you know? <laughs> Uh, but here's the problem is nobody, the reason nobody's doing it right now is because nobody believes that anybody will pay $10 a pound at scale for this as long as uh. there's $3 a pound dry rock that it will just take extra time. And I, I know that like right now there's people out there saying yes to both those things. Nope, I'd rather just cycle my own tank and spend uh, 300 bucks on 100 pounds of rock. Than 3,000. Yeah. yeah. And then there's somebody else out there that is saying, Nope, I would rather have my two months back and I just pay $1,000 for sure uh, mm. to have perfect biome uh, right off the bat and not have to worry about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm dying. Actually, if you feel like you are in one of those cases, you, either way, you know, share it in the comments because I will share this with the people that are considering doing it uh, and maybe they will go do it for all of us. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. All right. So what's next? Uh, now we have episode 11. From the 52 Weeks of Reefing, simple ways to create the perfect aquascape. Man, do we have a lot of good information that's coming to mind now, this day and age, than we had before. Uh, starting with our core belief. So the core belief here, if you believe this one, come along for the journey. If you don't, check out. Uh, <laughs> or maybe you'll learn something else <laughs> right, uh, new here. But... I think this is probably for most people. I think they're probably ready for this. Mm. An aquascape is for our eyes. A habitat is about caring for the pets. And you can have both. <laughs> yeah. Right? You yeah. don't have to be one or the other. But that is the core belief that I'm building an aquascape at this point. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be elaborate to, to fit this. You don't have to spend 20 hours trying to like build the perfect HNSA. You just have to think about this uh, in this frame of mind. You could probably create it using anything you want, stacking it, the wall method, anything. Um, it's an aquascape, though, is very much for our eyes. We're building something beautiful. Yeah, visually appealing. A lot, especially like, okay, think of the freshwater, too, and like the aquascape and uh, of like a freshwater planted tank. Those things are designed for the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not designed around a very specific species of fish that I want to keep or multiple species of fish. Uh, they're just, they're pieces of art. Uh, often they don't even have any fish. Yeah, aquascape is art and habitat is what you find when you go to zoos. 
Exactly. Yeah. When I heard the word habitat for the first time, I, like I started to process it. I'm like, you know what? When you go to a zoo, mm -hmm. they are very, very, they're not called aquascapes or whatever. No. They're, each one of them is a little habitat. It's a habitat. It's the so-and-so habitat. It's the other so-and-so habitat. Yeah. Yeah. And depending on the quality of the zoo, the quality of the habitat goes with it, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, you can tell, though, right away, the people that really paid attention, you know, the best zoos out there that, mm -hmm. like, decided to make this habitat, you know, beautiful, powerful, and appropriate for the animal that lives in it. And the one that I've shared before, but I'm going to share again, it really comes to mind, is the tiger that I saw yeah. in the Big Island of Hawaii. I, I happened to go to the zoo there. Uh, if you ever get a chance, go. It was pretty cool. But they have these white uh, tigers there. And the white tiger actually had, uh, I was watching it, and it wasn't following like a specific path. You know, normally you see these animals like kind of trounce back mm. and forth, and yeah. there's a sort of big rut of where it goes. And then I asked the zookeeper, like, why is it? And he said, all we had to do to make sure that wasn't the case is we built it into a hill where if he lifts up his head at any point in time, he can't see the entire area and he has to go inspect to make sure there's no other tigers here. Yeah. And that was the thing that keeps it interesting for him uh, and prevents him from essentially going out of his mind, <laughs> you know, creating a rat. I'm like, well, he really thought about what this animal needs and its normal behavior, applied it, and produced a much better result. Mm. We can do that in our tanks as well. So core belief here, an aquascapes for our eyes, habitats about caring for our pets, you can have both. What do we believe matters most? First thing we believe matters most about ah, the perfect aquascape uh, habitat means safety and shelter. So both of those. It's not uh, th this one. You know, is one that you found in the 360 is uh, with the after seeing the fish in uh, engage in the tank where you had an aquascape, not necessarily a habitat uh, or a habitat for those types of fish. Um, but w as soon as you put the little HNSA little uh, how homes that you built, these little tiny pieces and whatnot, immediately fish swam in there and now they're safe, the shelter, happy fish. You know, so I had overhangs and stuff and I thought that, you know, that was kind of it enough, mm. you know, they could kind of huddle under there. Uh, and it just turns out like that, you know, shelter and safety for a lot of fish means I'm kind of surrounded by on uh, three sides. Yeah, you know that they can kind of go in something and feel comfortable, and then what we found is like the first reaction is, well, I don't want that. I don't want to have my fish hiding from me all the time. It's actually we're finding the opposite is that happy, you know, healthy fish that feel like they have A safety and security to yeah. tend to swim in the water more often <laughs> because they have the place to go when they're not. And they're not getting harassed by all the other fish. And actually, we saw this first, and I think this isn't necessarily an aquascape, but it is habitat mm. in relation to the uh, clown harem series where we had enough of the rose bubble tip anemones in there that they, they would chase each other around, but they all had so much habitat, nobody yeah. really cared about anybody else's, <laughs> you know? And so the same thing when we built these habitat-based structures is if you can put enough holes, enough nooks and crannies in, in there, that you'll actually find safer, happier, more secure fish that will also be less stressed, less prone to uh, spreading disease around, less prone to uh, uh, mortalities, less prone to just killing each other, mm. right? And you'll have higher rates of introduction too. So like when I add a new fish to the tank, there won't, there'll be excess amount of habitat and shelter that when the fish needs to, it'll go find one that isn't already hosed by, housed by somebody else, <laughs> right? Uh, you're just gonna have a whole different trajectory if you think about what the animal needs and provide that for it as well. Mm. Uh, next one, believe matters most. For many tanks, the aquascape, the beauty or architecture uh, of the tank. So the aquascape ties it together. Okay, you know what? Sometimes you don't want that many fish. Yeah. Like, so we've seen those ones where like somebody built like almost like a tree of corals, right? Yep. You know, they build out the branches and then they plant all the corals on it and it becomes like a big floating tree or something cool like that. Uh -huh. And the only thing in there is like one yellow tank. <laughs> well, you know what, man? Like in that environment, habitat really isn't very important. No. 
Yeah. So defi decide what it is you're trying to achieve here, because if the only thing is I want a beautiful, stunning aquascape that is really powerful looking, and uh, I want a lot of negative open space, well, just don't add you know 80 fish to that tank, and you'll probably be good. Mm. So you know you find the balance between these things. If I want a lot of fish, you'll have higher success rates or higher percentage success rates. If I find that I provide the shelter and security that these fish want. Uh, and one habitat doesn't necessarily only apply to fish either. We're talking there's habitat for corals too. So mm -hmm. you think about the way that you plan out those types of aquascapes uh, for corals and coral growth and less capable warfare in between the two. Uh, we believe matters most is epoxy is best on dry rock. Found that one out uh, with a drop in uh, aquascapes uh, onto the ground at a foot and uh, upwards of five feet. And uh, also found that uh, epoxy is not the solution on wet rock. You know, it's so funny. I, I hated epoxy, man. My only experience with epoxy up until like a couple of weeks ago was like trying to push it into wet rock underwater and all it does is like deteriorate never <laughs> sticks the part, way i want yeah. it takes forever to cure uh it uh, is uh, the skimmers going nuts and like is it killing the fish no but like whatever is in the water that's like clouding it up and making the skimmer go crazy mm -hmm. probably isn't great for the fish's gills uh <laughs> maybe not toxic man but like i don't know there's nothing about the whole epoxy thing that i liked and then when I found the like the coral gum from tunes like that, I'm never going back. Yeah, for under underwater. No, but, none of that stuff happens. Cures fast. All the other stuff. But when you're uh, aquascaping dry rock, and especially when you're making uh, the HNSAs and the impossible angles, and uh, you know all of the weight of this uh, thing being supported back here on this single joint, uh, when you when you're able to put epoxy underneath and smash into the crevices and the nooks and the crannies and then it cures in you know a matter of minutes and now that is a stable strong bond that you can't hardly break not only that but even uh, because it's underneath the, those joints it naturally hides it 100% uh, epoxy you can't get mortar up in there unless you unless you make it really thick and then sling it in there and then uh, it drips nice. out. It's a mess, yeah. Okay, in fact, when we were creating uh, one of the the, uh, eight, the first HNSA, mm. uh, I was back there slathering all of this cement on there or or mortar and it's like, oh God, we're just mixing and I forgot how big a pain in the ass because it, it, it turns a rock so quickly. Yeah, it does. And uh, like it's, you have to find that perfect consistency. And even if you measure it out and I use grams and a certain amount of water, it never like, it's always this mess, man, I'm trying to go back and forth. I'm looking for this perfect peanut butter thing because if it's too dry it gets crumbly it's too wet it's sloppy <laughs> and i'm like in the right in the middle of starting that i'm like oh god i hate this and then i watched your video that came out literally that week and i'm like oh my god my epoxy my, 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 I use it we epoxy. tried one and I'm like well, you know dave smushed them up he gave it to me and like where you been my whole life <laughs> I, I like i i just like dry rock wet i still hate it Dry though, this is the way. Mm. And then when we built the most recent uh, uh, aquascape that we gave away in the dream tank, you know, I was able to secure that whole thing using epoxy almost exclusively just from the bottom where yeah. I didn't have to cover it up anymore. Yep. And then under the bottom, uh, when you put it into all the crevices, you don't even see it. You don't even have to hide it. Yeah. It's, it's so well smooshed into everything. You know, roll it up into a little tube, pack it in there, and you're done. And like we found that the sea cam cures in about five minutes, and the two little fishes is about 20 minutes. If you have a partner with you doing it, I think the five minutes is best. <laughs> if you're doing it all your own, probably the 20 minutes is best. Yeah. So, and one's darker, but they both cover really easy. So, I think that. Uh, yeah, man, epoxy is your best friend if you want to do this. Is it more expensive? Absolutely more expensive. <laughs> it goes but it's a lot of super strong and it's way easier to do. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, like for some people, just the cheapest is the only thing. But in this case, I think you could probably shave off five, six hours of work 
by using epoxy over the mortar and have a more desirable result in the end. And so the hundred bucks in epoxy may very well be worth it. Uh, speaking of cheap, uh, cheap option, uh, what we believe matters most is uh, mortar is the cheapest on dry rock. And it's true. I mean, the bucket of uh, Marco mortar, purple or gray or what have you, it makes a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I used only half for my mom's entire aquascape on her 120. Yeah. I'll give two things to mortar. So the mortar, you can get the same result as you can get an epoxy. Is it as strong as the epoxy? I don't think it fits into all the nooks and crannies the same way. Mm. Uh, so, and you can apply it as perfectly to all the areas. So probably not as strong, but definitely strong enough. Yeah. Right. So use the mortar. The one thing that it really does well, though, uh, if you go look actually at uh, the original uh, NSA, is you can use it to fill in some of the holes mm -hmm. on the uh, on the Marco rock because it's usually so porous, mm -hmm. and it gives it kind of more smooth ledge like an appearance. Oh yeah, yeah. you know. And so like when you look at the Haitian rock that's in my tank at home, it has that smooth like like plating type appearance to it mm -hmm. and you can actually fill in those holes with the mortar and I didn't do that on purpose I was actually doing that because I wanted to slather it on the top and it just kind of went over on the <laughs> edges and you know so be it uh, but eventually you could kind of see like oh well wouldn't it be look a little bit better if I filled in those couple holes too because they look uh, anomaly mm -hmm. but now I got these nice smooth nice you know arms on the thing <laughs> so you can use the mortar for multiple things but definitely definitely it is if you're looking for if you're a little extra work's okay it's definitely cheaper yeah that's a uh, another point too is the mortar uh, textures easier. And, and yeah. so epoxy, you found one of the drawbacks, one of the th reasons that we weren't talking about epoxy, you know, and, and you weren't considering epoxy in the first place is the experiences that we had with it. My experience, too, was using it underwater. And when I smashed that, that epoxy into the joints of the rock and it's wet and, uh, and then I put it back under the water, guess what's left over? My thumbprint is right in the epoxy and now it cures that way. It's yeah. smooth. Yeah, and then I used mortar, you know, I used mortar on dry rock and found that uh, oh, yeah, the texture's really there. You kind of did the same thing. Well, then they're out of that bread, the hi uh, hybrid of taking the epoxy, smashing it in place, and then you take a little piece of rock rubble and you smash it and imprint into the epoxy, guess what? It looks like a piece of regular rock when it dries. Yeah. All you need to do is give it some irregular surface and then it will hide the moment that you uh, put that liquid general bonding glue and then throw some of the sand or rock dust it on like it. Regular it's regular texture. Man. You'll yeah. never even know. Like You can look at this whole aquascape, you can't <laughs> see it from behind us, but like you can't see a single piece of where one thing started and the other, not a single smooth piece of yeah. epoxy, and it's so easy. Some chunks look like, oh, that's a single rock that you picked, and then you're like, no, that's about six, six pieces. You wouldn't yeah. even get, you wouldn't guess. You'd yeah. never know, hmm. yeah. I mean, even the whole thing to some degree, yeah. Uh, all right, for wet rock, though, our belief here, what is right? What is the best for wet rock? Super glue is the best for wet wet rock. And again, from uh, the investigates test that I did, you know, you soaked. We soaked some rocks for a while. Then we took them out, uh, applied all different adhesives, mortar, super glue, epoxy, hybrid type of sandwiches, all kinds of stuff. Uh, put them back together, and the ones that actually ended up holding the best because, and I believe it's because cyanoacrylate uh, cures be through moisture was the uh, super glue. Yeah, so uh, out of water, super glue, using the, you know, whatever gel you wanna use. Uh, underwater, uh, make sure you don't use bottles because if you let up on it a little bit, it'll suck water into it. There goes your whole bottle. Yeah, your whole bottle's <laughs> ruined. What you wanna use is the like 20 gram tubes that, you know, when you squeeze it, it's like the little mm -hmm. aluminum tubes or whatever yep. they are. Yep. Uh, but yeah, if you're gonna do aquascaping, I will find not only is the super glue stronger for wet surfaces than mm. epoxy or cement, but it also hides much better because you're not going to come back and cover it in dust or whatever, yeah. right? Uh, glue, and they're going to go through mm -hmm. those elaborate steps and wet rock. So, you know, glue, you can actually, you know, get balls of the glue or you can get it in areas and it has a little nozzle on it. You can form it around areas and not have it, and it's clear. It's like the part about the epoxy uh, is that the cement doesn't work on uh, wet anything yep. at all. But the part about the epoxies is 
Gray might look best on dry rock today. The lightest gray being maybe that sea kind of stuff today. Mm -hmm. But eventually the rock is going to turn purple and then the gray doesn't look good. And a lot of times the, the coralline doesn't grow on the epoxy so perfectly. quite a while. Yeah. And you just see this. And, like, and you if you use purple, purple, purple on white rock looks ungodly <laughs> awful. I would never in a million years <laughs> You have that. to wait until uh, it uh, catches up. It just, I mean, for the next two years, all you're going to see is just, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, super glue on wet rock uh, is probably the best solution. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, the people that I always add, that ask the question, so I've had my rock hearing for however many months, or I bought, I listened to what you guys said, and I said the first time I'm thinking about setting up a tank, I, I buy my rock right then and there and get it soaking and, and stuff like that. Well, uh, now we're saying, you know, you spend some time on the aquascape and do it dry. So if I followed our advice and I started cycling my rock and the, yeah, now I have to. Now I want to build an aquascape out of it, super glue, because it's already wet. So I'm going to amend, amend that council now. Mm -hmm. And the council, like, because at the time when we were talking about that, like, it wasn't really a priority for me to build a aquascape that could be removed. Yeah. And now with these HNSAs, one of the things I like the most about it is I can remove the whole thing without worrying about, can I, do I have to stack it back together? Can I get a fish out? Can I get whatever out? Can I move this tank around the house or to a new location in a different house or to the office or whatever I want to do with it? Having a single aquascape makes that so much easier. Yeah. So I'm going to amend that advice to cycling the rock uh, ahead of time to don't cycle the rock, Build the aquascape. Buy your rock, build the aquascape, cycle the aquascape. Cycle that when yeah. you do the rest of it. Yeah. You mean you just hit and we just you just hit on the next one. What we believe matters most is build the aquascape to be removed. Just yeah. for those very purposes. Like the the dream tank giveaway, the dream uh, reef giveaway, the aquascape that you built. Three pieces. Uh, the E170 is one one where this lesson would have been learned, uh, uh, was this is kind of where we learned the lesson was, uh, you know, there's fish in there that we wanted to get out. Uh, hard to do when all the rock is just stacked on top of each other. And the E-170 is fully groaned out. You know, there's there's large, beautiful colonies. It, removing any one piece of rock would ruin the whole thing. Putting it back together would be even more difficult. Uh, however, if we would have just done one structure, built it to be removed, we could have easily picked that whole thing up, corals and all, caught the fish, drop it right back in, and everybody's hunky-dory. So and there's another op, uh, issue that we run into now, which is the uh, XXL 750. We have like the first generation of that tank from Red Sea. Mm. And uh, as anybody else who bought that tank in the beginning knows that that one had a problem because it didn't support the front pane proper. Mm. And so that thing has a, a weak spot, and some of these things are failing. You know, these are this is a five-year-old tank. A big tank too. I, I would like to solve that problem, right? But we the tank is just now coming into itself. Actually, probably, I guess it's only like three years. But mm. like, it's just now coming into itself. Mm -hmm. We had some hurdles in the beginning, and now like there's really like a lot of the, cor the corals are like now colonies in there. But if I want to move that thing, this to a new tank, even if it was the exact same size tank, I can't. We cannot take all of that rockscape out and have it stacked back. We're gonna have mortalities for sure. It will never look it's the a same. Catastrophic destabilizing event. It would be a major setback for that tank. If we had three rock structures in there that look like they're intertwined, but all removable by themselves, we would lift it out, put it into a horse trough, Probably most of the corals, anything that didn't get bumped would be yeah. just fine. Put it, get us, get the exact same new updated tank, throw it in place, plumb it, put the put back it back in. in. There's so many instances, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you're doing the HNSA, you're doing just stacking rock. If you can build it in a manner where it's strong enough with the epoxy or mortar or whatever you're using, so that you could lift it out. There's so many points in your journey where you'll say, man, am I I'm glad, glad I, I made did that, that step. <laughs> uh, you'll never regret that you did that no, step. No, I don't think so. You'll never like, oh, that was a total giant uh, waste oh, of time. Man, I want to really yeah. move that piece of rock up to there now. Uh, yeah. no. I will never, I no matter how I do it, ever build an aquascape that can't be removed uh, <laughs> as either 
one piece or single intertwining pieces uh, that can go in and out of the tank the exact same way that they uh, went in. Yeah. All right, next one. Uh, believe matters most is build it for flow. And we uh, talked about this yesterday uh, in the f flow episode where we went back over the flow. And uh, you know, the, the good thing about so the, HN, the HNSAs that you're kind of building and, and these things are one made with the fish and the habitat in mind, made with the aesthetic appeal of an aquascape in mind. But inherently with that comes the uh, built for flow too, because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's NSA was the negative space aquascape, then the HNSA is the habitat negative space aquascape. Those, that N and the S, a part of the acronym being negative space, makes it designed for flow in mind. Yeah, the more open area, the more flow there will be, the more areas you can put it in. The big one for me, is actually getting flow behind the rock mm -hmm. work uh, and uh, opening up uh, all everything that that does. In fact, I remember when Joe from Unique Corals was here doing the aquascape on the 750, what he did is put cardboard on the back of it as a reminder like, to never touch. This is a no-no zone. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. ever touch the cardboard because we need to be able to have flow behind. And this is a guy that, you know, Unique Corals, uh, I think it's Manhattan Reefs, mm -hmm. you know, he has uh, coral farms in LA, one of the most successful people. And every single person that I've talked to will tell you about the benefits of getting flow in and around as many areas as humanly possible. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and not having dead spots all over the tank. So well, that, that brings to mind, you know, building this, uh, going back to the core belief here of uh, an aquascapes for our eyes, habitats for the pets. Corals are living creatures. They are pets, essentially. And mm -hmm. you know, when you're building for a habitat for your corals and a habitat-focused uh, environment for corals, uh, but yesterday's conversation about flow uh, and how you know flow is more important is one of the more important things. Uh, that's uh, where building these aquascapes, you know, you're keeping the the habitat of the coral in mind uh, because they need that flow. So. I can put corals in here. I'm going to keep looking over here because the HNSA is over there. But uh, you can put corals anywhere in there and trust that it will have the proper amount of flow that it needs. Yeah, never, never, never will worry about that problem. So when you're building it, think about, you know, the habitat. Think about the flow. Think about how the visual looks. Uh, but also think the next one, what we believe matters most, is stability. And that's really kind of how it's down to the like the newer entries of the foundation rock, which means rock that's been machined flat on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And what that rock allows you to do is like, you know, people talk all the time about like, should I put it on, stack the rock on top of the stand, sand? Should I put it on the bottom of the sand? Uh, will it settle out? Will it fill in? Blah, 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 blah. Well, the reality is, is I want this flat surface on the bottom of the tank, like on the glass, right? ABS. Yeah, uh, uh, or ABS, yeah, whatever. It, I want it on the bottom of the tank. I want this, you know, big flat surface that doesn't rock or roll, and the bigger the better. It'll attach on one area. This foot will act as a lever to hold all the weight. I would never build an aquascape without the foundation pieces again. And then some of them are really thin. They're only an inch or so mm -hmm. thick. And so a lot of it will actually be hidden by the sand as the sand goes over the top of it. So you won't even see it in many cases, but you'll see the structure will be really, really sound and will never topple over. Yeah. So uh, just relying on round surfaces that kind of roll around and settle out, uh, why? <laughs> yeah, there's a better way. <laughs> Uh, another thing we believe matters most is you're not stuck with boulders. Uh, that's the way Marco Ruck comes to you. That's the way all rock has been delivered up till then. And, and you know, it, uh, you, when I f would get rock, I'd be like, man, these are the pieces I'm stuck with. And I know I can break up a few chunks and get different, you know, sh uh, angles and pieces on it. But you took it to the next level and broke them up into tiny little pieces, reassembled them all back together. You know, it's funny, I guess that like- You were probably good at Legos. Well, I've kid. been doing this actually now. If you go watch, <laughs> like, do you remember the video where, where we pound, use a chisel and a hammer to mm -hmm. carve holes through Pukani? Yeah. Yeah, so like, we've been doing this stuff for ages, you know, it's just like, different rocks give you different uh, abilities, but the Pukani was kind of you know, softer oh, yeah, and porous. Soft. And so with a chisel and a hammer, like a, a fine, like a wood chisel, 
you could take a piece and like carve an entire hole all the way through the middle and maintain the, the whole structure. Mm -hmm. Or I could take a big boulder and then carve out a big, huge concave to create an, an overhang with it. And so you're not stuck with what you get. You can actually create what you want. Now with uh, you know, the Marco Rock, you can break it up and create whatever the hell you want. <laughs> and like, you can make any structure that you would ever any want. Any shape, size. Just break it up, put it back together. <laughs> make a little stick figure. Guy. I will say there is a little bit of the, you have to be good at Legos. Uh, I, a little bit of memory There's like in there. a design aspect to it, a creativeness, a uh, creativity aspect to it, too. I, um, maybe if I, if I put my mind to it, I could probably come up with something, but you have more patience than I do. Well, you know what actually is, uh, there's true inspiration of doing it yourself. And then there's also just emulating others, yeah. right? And so you can go watch our aquascapes and say, it's different to like decide like, I'm gonna create this idea out of my head. Or I can just say, you know what, I like that one. I'm gonna try my best to make it emulate that. And it will always deviate to your own thing. But that's what in the, in the last video on how to do the HNSA, I asked everybody when you build one, Upload a video of it uh, or show it on Facebook or Instagram with the hashtag HNSA uh, and other people will be able to see what you created as inspiration mm. for their own. So, uh, you know, Another good part about using, doing it in the fashion that you do with little tiny bits is uh, you start to build it and you go, man, I really hate that spot or I hate that piece. Break that chunk off. Break it right off. Easy. Start over. <laughs> Start over. Uh, Go I a mean, different direction with it. Yeah, I mean, there's just just, just chisel yeah. and hammer. It, it's a, a very interesting. So, like, I would say most boulders. people were just stacking rock for most of mm -hmm. the 20 years I've been doing this. Nope. So, like, I don't think you know, I did close anything. to anyway. I don't think I didn't do anything other than try the metal rod uh, or the fiberglass rod trick I to make an overhang. <laughs> yeah, I hated that method. It was uh, it's really hard. Yep. Uh, all right. So another piece, uh, what matters most here is consider subhabitats. Yeah, the little right? uh, little. You know, people say, "Oh, a lot of times you and you want a coral. You know, you have a coral that's going to spread like crazy. You put it on an island, uh, but you you can turn the, it, those islands, or you can just uh, like you had." Uh, was it Anthea's that you needed needed a home and didn't really have a, a space in your Tahitian, uh, you know, aquascape in there? Build them a little uh, kind of igloo, HNSA, tiny little structure, drop it in. They live there now. Yeah. So all you need is a bunch of rubble and just kind of layer it together, and there'll be little holes just all over the place. Guy. And visually, out from the outside. It'll actually just look like uh, an island, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually just a network of little holes. And your wrasses will live in there. Uh, you'll see like chromis and stuff that would normally live in. The acros will like all swarm into it. And you know, a lot of like community type fish will live those things. So if you have like a NSA and you just don't want to fill all that space in, create little habitats somewhere else in the tank. You can actually <laughs> just lean them up against the rock too. And actually, I found that I could build those little uh, like uh, mini habitats. Stack and I, them on top of each other? Well, I found if I put them onto areas of the rock, the aquascape already built, it actually finished. It was like a finishing touch <laughs> in many cases. So, you know, consider that you have little islands and subhabitats would be great for corals that you just don't want to spread, mm -hmm. but also great for little colonies of fish or, or wrasses as well. Okay, uh, another thing we believe matters most is the highest percentage results come from inspiration uh, or, or emulation. So uh, if this is your first rodeo, like I just said a moment ago, go find an aquascape out there, Google it, Google the HNSA, Google just aquascaping, whatever it is, and say, that one speaks to me. Go try, try to, to build it. Something mm -hmm. like that, or, or take elements from it for yourself because you know, it, stacking rock, nobody needed help with. Stack all the rock <laughs> out and make a big wall. Nobody really needed help no, with that. No. Uh, but if you want to create something really cool and interesting, and you've never done it before, often the highest percentage results of something you'll be really happy and proud of will come from the inspiration of the people that have done it before you, uh, especially the ones that have done it really well. If you're inspired by the HNSA or the NSA, we've got two one-hour-long videos how to do them. 
Yeah, well, the one is uh, like literally, man. We walk through every last step, and it is like 50 minutes. But it, <laughs> like it's the it's the finer details that really help you succeed in this case. Yeah. So uh, let's share them all. Uh, next thing we believe matters most is this is all why a deeper and tall tank is better for a reef. That deeper meaning front to back, uh, than it is tall, uh, being better than uh, for the reef. Yeah. So reef tanks. I don't know why, but so many of them are the same dimensions mm -hmm. as they are tall, and many of them are actually like not as deep. They're only 18 inches, and they're 24 inches tall. It makes for a really crappy aquascape in most mm. cases. It's really hard to create that depth. I will tell you, working on uh, uh, the Dream Tank one, which is uh, 29 inches deep and 22 tall, mm. was a dream. It allowed <laughs> for so many more changes, our, our like sense of depth and like how the the aquascape, aquascape could just kind of sprawl mm -hmm. instead of just being this like wall that you'd have to like build, look for height everywhere. Build up, yeah. Yeah, and so I think anybody that's ever had a tank that was deeper front to back than tall will tell you they really, really, really like it. <laughs> uh, and so, and it's usually experienced reefers because I don't know why, but like there aren't that many deep dimension tanks uh, uh, out there especially you know in various grades like they they exist like in marine lands and yeah. stuff but like yeah. you know the red seas and the water boxes and stuff of the world don't really make them mm. that i'm aware of anyway uh and so they don't really exist in a common format uh and so you have to get them custom which makes it expensive yeah right uh, hopefully somebody will start making more like reef ready really yeah, the, like, do redefine the term reef ready to mean deeper front to back than tall. Yeah, I, plus, I plus your uh, overflows are. But uh, when you're building habitat, you're building a really beautiful, powerful aquascape. Deep, deeper front to back is is how you're gonna do it. <laughs> okay, hard lessons on aquascaping. Starting with uh, a couple of days now will pay for years to come. So a lot of people uh, we've shared uh, the past and they're like, well, I'd never spend that much time on it. Actually, even you said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I still don't think I could. <laughs> but here's the thing is like, they got easier each time. And mm -hmm. the last one took me about 20 hours to do. And yeah, 20 hours sounds like a lot, uh, but at the same time, I'm going to be looking at this thing, hopefully, for five, six plus years, man. Like I'm going to be looking at it for a long time. And every time I see it and somebody says, man, that's cool. A little shot to my pride, right? <laughs> like, like, ah, oh, yeah, I did that. And, you know, that was really fun. Actually, it was something I really enjoyed. And so it's a hobby. It's yeah. not a race. I'm not here, like, trying to get to the finish line as fast as possible. In fact, in some cases, I wish the finish line was a little further out so I could enjoy the other steps along the way. Mm -hmm. So, huh. you know, obviously, you don't always agree with this I, one. This one is... I, I don't know if I have the patience to spend a week on an aquascape. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's funny, man, because it's to each their own. Yeah. Like, I couldn't do it any other way, and we've had this conversation 15 times now, and you're like, <laughs> nope, I'm not going to do it that way. So I think that probably the audience here and all the other reefers listening are probably thinking half, a few on, half the other way. a few on, on both sides. Yeah. Uh, another hard lesson learned, and it's sitting right behind me, is that uh, half of the tank rule for SPS if you plan on having a SPS, SPS dominated system uh, like the 160 back here, uh, don't scape higher than half of the tank. It's super hard. You're going to struggle with it. It looks like it looks empty and weird and foreign for the first. I mean, even the 750 XXL right now still looks like what's missing here because it, it looks empty. Yeah, you just it's going to be really hard. But then one day. Uh, the colonies, like you had a 24 inch tall tank, you probably don't really want within three or so inches of the top anyway. Mm. It's 21 inches. Uh, and if I went to half, man, eventually you're gonna have eight inch colonies on the top. Now it looks empty when they're one inch nubbins, you yeah. know, but like you don't want them growing out of the water, man. <laughs> and so. Uh, you want water flow around and in and throughout. Well, it's challenging. Uh, it, it looks empty though. Well, yeah. And now, I mean, you look at the 160 and it's completely jam-packed full. And, but there's a challenge now with uh, all of that, you know, the top of the corals that are above the surface of the water, they're, they are uh, algae magnets when it comes to like algae, you know, needs 
bone, uh, like non-tissue material to grow on and start to take over. So when you, uh, all of that stuff that's raising up to the surface and dying because of, of course it can't grow out of the water, now holds on to little bits of algae and whatnot. And then flow is extremely difficult once they reach that high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another hard lesson for me was uh, the rod method just isn't worth it. I'd be curious <laughs> to hear what you, what you felt about it, uh, but I just didn't feel like it was worth my time. It was way more effort than needed. I, I had a guy, uh, I mean, I made some really nice overhangs with it before, but uh, trying to attempt that now with uh, the rock that's available the, the most, which is the, the Marco type rock, uh, it was easy when I was using Fiji and Pukani. Uh, because the stuff is so easy to drill through and it's soft and uh, you know I could drill a hole drill a hole cut a piece of fiberglass rod and stick it in there together and call it a day uh, Marco rock yeah, a little harder to kind of work with like that but so Marco rock tends to explode uh, when you're trying to drill through mm. it especially if you use a hammer drill uh, and the Fiji or the Pukani was like butter right uh, the Fiji to me man actually was really hard to drill through too mm. it, it, like it would you could burn up, you know, masonry <laughs> bits. Yeah. Uh, here is the part that I I didn't like, is that, you know, you got two rocks and you're trying to like stack them in this perfect way, and so you'd have to have somebody hold the thing in the perfect way, and then drill the rod through at a like parallel line or a straight line, mm. and inevitably it never did that, and so like the hole would end up being at a different angle, and so the resulting rock would be at a different <laughs> angle, and. Ultimately, I was just like, I don't know, this is a lot of work. And now when I look at it, I'm like, for avoiding $5 in epoxy, <laughs> I'll pay the five bucks for some epoxy, man. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's like more really than adequate for the purpose. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's some people out there that love the rod method. For me, I just don't believe in it and I wouldn't use it. There's so many better ways yeah. that uh, produce a better result with lower frustration, especially with uh, today's type of rocks well, now, available. Well, now when I see the uh, the impossible overhangs of the HNSAs and stuff like that, and how you got how to get there with epoxy and glue and insta set and all of this, and then going back and hiding all the joints, I, I would never do a rod again, it's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the next one. A uh, hard lesson learned was that dry live rock has a nutrient sink. Yeah, so dry live rock, uh, well, we found, and you don't really see it very much anymore, no. but was a hard lesson was things like Pukani mm. seem to have like an almost never ending nutrient sink. In and, it. oh, it's like uh, people would, um, it's, it's in like a nutrient battery, right? And uh, there's so many times where the question was asked is like, uh, or that uh, comment or that, uh, that discussion thread on the forums would happen where my, my rock is causing my phosphate issue. My rock is leaky, leaching phosphates, leaching phosphates, leaching phosphates. Yeah, it was. You know what? I, we found this out like towards the end of its availability. Right? Yeah. And like, I don't know, I read somewhere that like, hey, if phosphate has uh, combined with the uh, calcium or whatever it does, on the rock surface, it's probably going to be permanently bound up there. It's not going to be constantly releasing or whatever. Mm. And then I read later that that isn't true. You know? <laughs> and this is the nature of actually, I didn't seek out a scientist in this. I was reading what was properly believed by the reefing community, mm. which was like flipping back and forth. Right, right, you know? right. I probably sort of sought out a chemist. Uh, but uh, what I found right before the stuff just started to dissipate was we went and cured a bunch of it. And like my thought process was always that the nitrate and phosphate came from the organics because there was like sponges and mm. crabs and crap all over in this stuff. Right? Yeah, especially Pukani, that's super yep. porous, meaning that these small organics uh, still linger deep inside. Okay, so we would we tried a bunch of different ways we cured it with water mm -hmm. we cured it uh, with acid we cured it with bleach and by the way bleach is by far the best method of getting the organics off the oxidizes rock oxidizes the heck out of it yeah it just ox like like acid sounds like right but it actually just eats some of the surface of the rock 30% that, loss in yeah it. and it gets really sharp mm -hmm. uh, it's the uh, uh, bleach that actually oxidized all the organics off but what we found is, you eventually you'll hit the point where it no longer adds nitrate to the tank. 
Mm -hmm. And that meaning to me that uh, the organics, whatever organics were there, were broken down. But man, the phosphate. Still. <laughs> yeah, like you'd add the, you, you would, I would get a phosphate reading, and then it, it was, I don't remember what it would get to, but it would get to like 0.1, and then it would stay there. It wouldn't go any higher than that. Yeah. And then we'd do a 100% water change, and then we'd go back up to 0.1, and then it would stay there. It wouldn't get any higher. And then we do 100% water change, and it would slowly go back up to 0.1, and it stay there. And like, I don't really know the mechanism of what was happening there, but mm -hmm. apparently there was some kind of equilibrium of phosphate in the water and whatever stuck to the rock that it found its way to around <laughs> 0.1. I, and I, I'm just theorizing here, to be honest, but like it became a moot point quickly after, after Fiji shut down the export of yeah, uh, Pukani. The, there's nothing left. But this is probably, you, know, you could point fingers at uh, Pukani, like, oh, well, that must be bad. Well, eventually every piece of rock you put in your tank is going to have that same kind of thing, man. The phosphate is going to get bound to its surface the same way it did mm. in the ocean. Uh, and it's probably gonna have a very similar result. Mm. I can't, I mean, they're just calcium chloride or calcium carbonate based structure. So what magic thing about that one's different than another, <laughs> especially because phosphate's at such a higher concentration in our tanks than it is in the ocean. Uh, I don't know. Mm. You know, it would be different though is because the phosphate that's bound up in the Bucani was actually, it's like Pacillopora, mm -hmm. I think skeleton. Yeah. Uh, and then Often what we're using now is a man-made, or not man, like a, a million-year-old mind rock. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, under a lot of pressure, heat, all kinds of stuff. And I never get any phosphate. That one, the the, the mind stuff, like I've, we've never gotten a phosphate reading out of using new stuff, curing it, doing mm -hmm. all the things. So the only way would be if it like pulled it out of the water, bound it up, and then re-released it some other day. Yeah, it's possible, but. The stuff that was coming from the uh, Pukani was the fact that it was probably built into its skeleton as it was growing mm -hmm. to begin with. Yeah. Uh, another hard lesson learned here is uh, promoting Coraline is the best way to outcompete many issues. Uh, Coraline's on it, algae can't be on the Coraline. The Coraline will prevent a lot of pests from settling. Yeah. Right. And so the if you can get Coraline to grow uh, on the tank, whether I found the best ways is to find some source of Coraline from a tank you deem safe fish. Yeah. Not, uh, not this 160. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you can scrape off a chunk of it and then kind of grind it up into a, like a powderish, turn off all the pumps and let it settle out somewhere in the tank, that turns out to be the best way to spread it throughout. There's also that stuff from like Arc Reef, the Coraline in a bottle. Oh, yeah. I've had, I, I haven't had a, enough experience with it to say. Is that the only thing you seeded your 360 with? Nah, we ended up putting corals in there too. But that, that tank had so many ups and downs, it's hard to really pin. point the finger. You yeah, know, I, I'd love to test that again, whether or not Coraline in a bottle actually works. But uh, I'd love it. It should. If it doesn't work that way, I mean, I've always thought that somebody should just grow it on little glass slides oh yeah you know and then overnight you the glass uh, slides are the different colors and you can just scrape it off with a razor into the tank That'd be know, great. Like, somebody should do that if, they, if you're farming <laughs> uh if you're gonna farm rock do the coralline thing too well you know you think about it like you know it's hard to like look at bottles of water and feel like there's anything in them right? <laughs> but if you send me a little dish of trays of coralline algae growing on the surfaces that i'm scraping off I know what that is. That's material. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. So it's probably not only helpful, but also marketable, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, Coraline algae, if you can promote it. And the best things you can promote Coraline algae, by the way, is maintaining an 8.3 pH as well as a, a, a high alkalinity. So those two things will you know, fuel Coraline algae growth. I've found that low pH tanks just don't grow mm. uh, uh, Coraline algae. In fact, what we found at one point was a lot of people believed that Kalkwasser tanks grow coralline algae better. Oh, it right? makes sense if your Kalkwasser's raising pH. So you can say, well, is it the Kalkwasser or is it the two part? It's because the Kalkwasser's raising the pH more than the two part is, the there hydroxide. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and that's at least what I believe anyway. But high pH will allow thing organisms to calcify faster. They can precipitate the skeleton out faster. We've seen it time and time again. So mm -hmm. if you want to promote coralline algae, that is the best way to outcompete many pests that grow on surfaces. 100%.
another hard lesson. Golf Rock is a double-edged sword. This one is uh, one we're learning actually right now. I think my first experience with like Golf Rock or real actual uh, live rock shipped uh, overnight from the, the ocean. So I've never seen it before in first hand, never used it before first hand. Uh, but once we got it, there was like, man, look at all the cool stuff on here. If you walk the average person around all 12 tanks and you didn't tell, and only asked them which one do you like the most, 100 out of 100 pick that one. Yeah, there's orange sponges on there, there's life on there, there's big giant gorilla crabs that are actually eating the, some of the coal <laughs> the, uh, the clownfish. But uh, double edged sword, though, meaning that hey, you want like insta tank cycled and ready to go, like we said uh, up at the top of the last one, uh, you know, one of the uh, was it uh, uh, Live Rock is one of the best for the first 12 months of a brand new reefer, you know, mm -hmm. because it gets you there. Uh, it's like, oh, it's almost instantaneously, but then it comes with all those pests. Dude, you look at it, like I said, 100 out of 100, look at it, say, oh, look at it, it's covered in purple and orange uh, sponges and coralline. There's zoanthids growing on it. There's feather dusters growing on it. There's all these little critters already on it. Uh, cool. Hundred <laughs> percent. Right, but also all those pests that come with it, fish eaters, parasites. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think one of the things I would do if I use golf rock is I would go fowler with, or or I would go fit without fish for two months. Hmm. So I I would make sure like the parasitic isopods and stuff like that. I figure out whatever the life cycle of those types of things are. And I would have the tank up and going without mm. those things in it for a period of time because yeah. I don't want, that's the stuff that matters to me the most. I don't, I don't want to see my fish with a parasite hanging no. off of it. I just want to, I just want to order live rock uh, again and put it in its own tank of its own just to see what, what it comes with and watch that stuff live. Yeah, you I'm, know, I'm, I'm just excited to see the pests. That's one thing that, uh, like, oh man, because it's just like a surprise every day. Was... We joke all the time. Like some of you probably heard the story before, but uh, we had a, a gentleman here, Brandon, <laughs> that bought some of this, and and he came to work one day, and he's like, "Dude, I have a fish in my tank, and I didn't put any fish in the tank. <laughs> you ever heard of a hitchhiking fish before?" And uh, I like, oh my god do you have cucumbers? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I put some cucumbers in there. Like, you got a butt fish. <laughs> There's uh, this long little skinny fish that lives inside the butts of, uh, of <laughs> cucumbers. And so you get these kinds of things. You know, uh, golf rock, those are fairly common. Uh, uh, people get octopuses and stuff. Oh, yeah. And like, yeah. you get all kinds of really crazy stuff. You probably don't know how to care for an octopus is the sad part. But, nope. <laughs> like, you get all kinds of really weird stuff when you, when you get that level of life. Because what they do with that golf rock is they take all that mind rock from Florida and they just go drop a whole, you know, container ship of the stuff off the side of the uh, boat. And they come back three years uh, later and collect it all. And now it's filled with all kinds of life. It's ready right? to go. Yeah. And they bring it back to you. And because it's, it's not like, at one point we decided to get air rock from, from uh, Fiji. And so it was kind of the same thing. They would pull it out and put it in Fiji. And that Fiji rock, you had to turn it around in L.A., get it immediately on a plane because all the sponges, all the other stuff on it starts to die pretty rapidly when you pull it out of water. Mm. And they actually, you know, to do the dry, or not the dry, but the, like, normal Fiji boxed rock that sits on a container ship for two months, they'd scrub all of the sponges and all the life off of it first, yeah. right? Well, with the golf rock, they bring it in and they usually put it in bags of water and then ship it airport to airport. So you'll have to go to your local airport and pick it up, but it's still sitting in bags of actual water. Mm. That's why all this stuff stays alive. And some of you are like, oh, that speaks to me. And other people have gone through it. will say, yeah, that was a really cool experience. Like I, I'll just say for me, it was a really cool experience for my first tank. I, it, I think it was part of why my first tank was so successful. And I'd never do it again. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Would you do it? Uh, yeah, just because I want a tank that just has. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna set that tank up for anything else. I'm just gonna buy the Golf Rock just to see what just comes to on see it. See what comes on yeah. it. That's an interesting take on mm -hmm. it, actually, because you actually get all the weird stuff out of the ocean, right? Uh, all right, next one. Uh, hard lesson learned: uh, assuming that epoxy and glue will go away, and 
my aquascape in my office. I did nothing but gobs and gobs of super glue, and now I've got gobs and gobs of super glue two years later. Still can see it. Yep. It didn't, it didn't get hidden. So a lot of people say, like, oh, why are you spending all that time trying to hide the glue and the epoxy? And it's because <laughs> it's an eyesore. You know, yeah. and like, oh, he'll get covered in uh, coralline algae yeah. and gunk someday. If you if you uh, let go of that mindset, you'll be a lot happier, and you won't be like you won't be surprised when you st not still see epoxy. You know? I'm just gonna say it like it is. I think part of this is just defense against the fact that I didn't do it before, and I want to feel okay about it. Could be. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know because if you cover it up and make it look nice, it'll look nice from day one. And the part that a lot of people miss is the parts of the epoxy and glue that aren't exposed to light are never going to grow coral and algae on it, mm. right? And so you're just going to see that stuff forever until something grows in the way. There is a way to hide <laughs> it to day one. If this you can, do it. Let's put some super glue down and spray yep. some sand on it. Even, even if you just you put some super glue and sand on it and it didn't even match the color that you're looking at. That will eventually grow stuff on it. The sand will actually grow stuff on it faster than the purple epoxy mm -hmm. or whatever will. So Yeah. All right. Uh, all right, not being able to move the 170, oh, hard lesson. Uh, we already talked about this a little bit, but for us, not being able to move the 170 or the 750. And actually, the 170, the E170, we put a yellow tang in there in the beginning, mm. right? Uh, and the, the process we always said is, hey, dude, you just, when you, the tang outgrows the, that small space, you just move it. Well, you know, it got to the point where it was big enough that it needed to be moved out of that tank, uh, but we couldn't catch it because there was so much coral growth in there. And eventually, man, we had to trim the hell out of all the coral and yeah. you know, broke a bunch of it trying yeah. to get this fish out. Yeah, I tried to chase him with a tube because it got he. There's a little nook under in the back behind it, and kind of wiggle him out, blow some bubbles in there, try to get it out. No. Got it eventually, but it if we could have just lifted the aquascape out, easier. took the fish out, and put it back in, done. Yeah. So especially for small tanks, if you're going to put a fish in, you know full well is going to outgrow this tank. The one aquascape that's stable and built is a single piece. Big yeah. win. Yeah. Not just for ease for you, but even uh, lack of stress on everybody else, corals included. Like if I can remove this, if I can pull out my rock, get what I need and put it back together like that, uh, I don't have to do what I did on the E170 and just chop, 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 coral, ch haircuts, you know, fissure, uh, all, yeah, there's detritus, there's everything, you know, you're stirring up everything. So some of you are probably already bought in, but I'll tell you, everyone who's built an aquascape that is a one piece and had uh, the satisfaction of being able to pull it out in one piece will say, Oh, I'm so glad I did this. You know, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. The a hard the the hard lesson here also is uh, you heard this already, but uh, build it dry and then cure. Don't cure the rock first and then. The curing all the rock first kind of came from an era which wasn't all that long ago, which yeah. is I'm just going to stack and glue it together yeah. so it really doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be out of the water that long or I can even do it underwater. Not doing that anymore. Yeah, well now build the aquascape and then go cure it in the, you know, the like a, either a horse trough or a, your salt mixing bin or whatever it is. Uh, if you cure it with a epoxy, you can actually just set it on pretty much any side. I mean, our our whole aquascapes, I'm flipping them around all over the place, and they never broke. And in fact, I, I I look for it to break. I'm I'm intentionally turning it upside down and doing work on it so that it does break, uh, so I know where the weak spots are, and I can actually put more oh, epoxy yeah. in. Mm -hmm. So embrace the break. <laughs> all right. So, what's next? Up next, we have episode 12 of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one was called Proof. Live sand isn't as dull as you thought. And uh, I don't know if you thought live sand was dull, because it might be, but it is not. There's here. more to sand than you think there was. <laughs> There's a lot to, yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially I, if you go without it. Then I think we realize. actually learned a lot of sand since then. So mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those ones where the conversation about sand has definitely evolved uh, since where we're at. I think there's still a lot of unknowns about sand that uh, I'm going to poke a couple of holes in today because mm. I wish there's still things I wish I knew, right? Okay, so this is a core belief about sand. So this is the thing that drives all of the decisions and all of the things that we believe here. Sand is a beautiful problem. Prioritize, prioritize what matters to you most. I'll say it again. 
Sand is a beautiful problem. <laughs> Prioritize what you matters most. What that means is most people will say the tanks look way better if they have sand in them. Oh yeah, they're gorgeous. Right? Sand's and gorgeous. It, it's part of the natural look, and you know you can debate yeah. whether or not you actually see sand on the bottom of uh, when you're snorkeling because you really can't. It's usually 20 more feet down, mm. but it doesn't matter. Most people will tell you in a tank in your house, sand looks better. 100. percent Okay, especially versus a dirty bottom. You know, and even having corals cover it, it looks really kind of it's weird, artificial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but there's all kinds of ups and downs with sand, uh, and so the outcome of this isn't going to be a right answer. Like, uh, you know, Randy's not right, Ryan's not right, you're not right, because. This could be one of those questions of which is the best option for you. It can also be a question of which is the least worst option for you, <laughs> which is the inverse of either one of those things, because you really can't solve all problems in this case with one decision. You're just gonna have to pick and then decide what you wanna do from there. <laughs> so what do we believe matters most? Uh, first thing that we believe matters most is that sand tanks are easier for the first year or two. And I mean, we learned this lesson publicly with the 750XXL, it was a tough two years, bacterial blooms, dinos, the whole nine. Uh, it was built for, with flow uh, in mind, uh, being bare bottom, but had we had sand on there, it would have been an easier first two year ride. Okay, so I've seen this enough times to say with almost absolute certainty, say almost, I think I can actually just say absolute certainty, if you put sand in the tank, it will be an easier first two years, especially an easier first six months. There's just way fewer issues. Yeah. Like you don't see the uh, bacterial blooms or the clouds of the water. We see those constantly in bare bottom uh, tanks without sand and especially with dry rock. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't see the dinos as often. You don't see this. And part of the reason that I believe that that's true is people think of surface area where you know all the bacteria live is on the surface of the Just rock. Just the rock, yeah. The rock is a calcium carbonate-based rock, and they all live on there. Tons more in the sand. The sand, dude, if you think about 100 pounds of rock and the amount of exposed area on your 100 pounds of rock versus the 100 pounds of sand, which is crumbled into teeny little bits. It's kind of like that carbon analogy mm -hmm. where a, table, a teaspoon of carbon, actually, if you were able to flatten out the pore structure, covers an entire football field. Yeah. There's so many, like this honeycomb of network of pore structure. Sand, not all that different. Once you crush up all 100 pounds of rock into little bits of sand, way more surface area and this is where all the food and poo settles out. Yeah. So the food for that bacteria is actually living in the place where it all settles out. And that is why I believe that sand will actually help cycle the tank faster, create biome faster. Mm. It will outcompete some of the organisms that thrive in that environment. Uh, and it's just a lot easier to set up a tank with sand in the beginning. However, inverse. Bear bottoms uh, can be harder for the first two year or two. So if you're willing to embrace that, uh, it's going to be a rough, bumpy ride for the first two. But you want that bear bottom tank, uh, you can go into it knowing that, man, in two years this is going to be awesome. So yeah, it's down the road, the bear bottom has this benefit. A, you're going to have a tremendous amount of flow. So this is really, really popular with stick heads, mm -hmm. right? So I love all my SPS corals. I'm really into it. I want to provide flow. I can't, the sand is blown all over the damn place. Yeah. I can't create the amount of flow that I want with these in here. Number one rule. Number two rule is because the sand just becomes a nutrient sink or a time bomb. Like it just soaks up all of the garbage in the tank and you can't really flush it all out of the tank very good. And so when I'm putting pumps on the bottom of the tank and flushing all of the, uh, the food, instead of letting the poo and the shrimp and the pellets settle out in the sand, all that flow keeps it suspended, goes down the overflow where the skimmer and the filter socks and the roller mat and all the filtration, the uh, refugium, everything, it settles out in there and it's all sucked out uh, as part of your filtration. You don't have nutrient issues, you don't have long-term issues in the same way. And so long-term, the, the bare bottom is 
way more stable mm. in my mind. Yeah. Right. It has way fewer things that are going to go wrong uh, in the long run. It just has short-term hurdles. <laughs> For two years worth of short-term. You have to decide, man, yeah. like which one of those priorities is important to you uh, because one of these things will be true most of the time for most people. <laughs> yeah. Next uh, we believe matters most is uh, don't go more than a one-inch sand bed. Yeah, like past one inch, uh, it just starts to become a sink for God knows what. Well, not to mention, like, anytime you see some of those deeper sand beds, you know, I may vacuum, and it, it, is kind of, it is difficult to vacuum beyond an inch of sand when you're sucking it up, but you look at the front of the glass and that whole line of sand in the front of the glass, because you can't really vacuum so it is deep, it just looks nasty. Green, ucky, pinks, you can see the little bug trails and, you know. So back in the day, there was a thing called a very deep sand bed or something like yeah, that, and yeah. you'd have like you know, six, eight in inches, and what you'd do is create areas within the tank that uh, anaerobic. would house anaerobic yeah. bacteria that pull the nitrate and phosphate out of the tank. Okay, cool, but like now, man, between today's skimmer technology, the roller mats of the world, the, the refugiums, the algae scrubbers, nutrients aren't the same just, problem. Yeah, were. you don't need, if that was a method for controlling nutrients before, it's unnecessary now. Yeah, I mean, could, but it's, it's not as important mm -hmm. as it once was. Uh, you know, you got nitrate reactors even now. You got all kinds of different things. So that isn't the same thing. But what I will tell you for sure is that in that sand is all kinds of gunk. It's all kinds of organics. It stinks like rotten eggs when you mix it up. It's true. If you go and mix it up in the areas that don't get turned over very often, you could watch all kinds of brown crud come floating out of it. So that tends to happen worse and worse the more that you go over one inch. So... If I was buying anybody counsel, I would stay under one inch, knowing full well that some areas will get little dunes mm. uh, that are, are more than that. But I, I wouldn't shoot for anything beyond that. In fact, if I could, without blowing it all over the place, I'd shoot for like a half inch. I have one, uh, one break to that rule where I would uh, break the one inch sand bed. Uh, and that is uh, my little mangrove tank over there. And oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, those... Uh, I have, I think I have uh, six inches of sand in that mm -hmm. little tank over there, but that's because those mangroves need that for their root structure. So you purposely chose that uh, that plant to thrive, and that's the best way to get it to what it needs. It's kind of also like a remote DSP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. uh, having that big, you know, eight-inch sand bed in the sump in your or refugium in your area. Refugium. Yeah. And what's cool about that too is you don't have the same issues there as you do everywhere else in the tank because uh, down there you don't have like a power head that one day might fall off and then blow all the sand mm -hmm. and you know like dig a big hole in the pollutants in this thing and <laughs> release all this hydrogen sulfide into the tank or yeah. whatever it's a much safer area in a remote uh, refugium like that uh -huh. okay uh, all right so what believe matters most what grade of sand do you use uh, no, okay, I'll read it. Uh, special grade or bigger in most cases. Don't buy anything smaller. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, when's the last most. time you used anything other than special grade? I don't think I ever have. I've used the Ocean I'm, Directs a few times, but, uh, and uh, you know, it's a mix. It's it. kind of a mix between the, uh, the it's got some ooh light particles in it, it's got some special grade particles in it, just because it's not sifted the same way. If the special grade wins out really well in our biome testing and cycle testing, I would definitely use it in the future. If it doesn't do so good, just go special, back to grade. special grade. And I'll say, uh, in terms of uh, sand too, there are ebbs and flows. Do we talk about dry sand in here anywhere? I don't think we do. Mm -mm. So there's two, special grade comes in dry, and it also comes in a, a live format, yeah. right? Okay. The dry stuff is cheaper, especially when you count in the fact that it doesn't have uh, any of the uh, uh, water weight in it. Right. But man, is it dusty. Be prepared to. Rinse it a dozen times because uh, 
still comes out with dusty finds. And, and it will and it won't be like the live sand where you're like, ah, tomorrow will be just fine. It could go on for a week. <laughs> uh, and then if you stir it up again, it will happen all over again. Uh, if you have a and if you have a filter roller mat, then you're just eating and chewing through filter paper because it's constantly getting clogged. Uh, your filter socks are constantly getting clogged for days on end. I personally wouldn't use dry sand again. Mm. Uh, and so I, the live sand is more expensive, but I, I'd be curious to hear people chime in if they had similar experience with the dry sand. But the best way if you want to use a dry sand is get a bucket, like a five gallon bucket, coil your garden hose down in the bottom of it, fill the sand on it and turn it on. And what will happen is it'll just kind of turn it over and then the fine, the little dusty fines flow over the edge. And once it runs clear for more than an hour or so, you're probably good. <laughs> so don't just like mix it up. I mean, you need to actually flush all the garbage out of mm. it. Uh, and then in most cases, like whatever residual droplets of water that's from your hose that's in there is probably reef safe because you're going to dilute it by a magnitude mm. of a million. Uh, oh, once yeah. you After fill you water, drain it that's out. a common question <laughs> in my own belief structure anyway. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next one. Uh, we believe matters most. Clean the sand, but be careful in stirring up what's in the underneath. You know, so clean the sand, like uh, this is the part that I waver on. Like, you know, I've talked to people, they're like, hey, just let the sand be the sand. And yes, it's a toilet. But like the problem is, is like it just gets worse and worse and worse over time. It mm. becomes, you know, just soaking up more and more and more of the nutrients in the water over time and all of the garbage in there. And it just becomes a bigger and bigger sink. Just waiting for that time bomb of a pump aimed down at it or something to stir it up. But also what you don't want to do is go take your siphon and just like stir it all up and release it all into the tank. You should, if you're going to clean it, you should probably do it in a more controlled chunks, format. Chunks at a time. Yeah, just like little bits using your siphon and just letting it suck all that brown garbage down the tube. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Do you, How do you feel about cleaning the sand? Uh, well, I have a bare bottom tank, so I don't have to clean the For sand. For a reason. <laughs> All right. So I, it's another one of those things. I know I'm not going to spend a, a whole lot of effort to do. So why would I even have it in the first place? And I will, I will embrace the one to first one to two years. There you go, man. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> this one's actually kind of funny. Hit the next one. Here. Uh, what we believe matters most is live in a bag is much less dusty, but the live part is not overly valuable. So the live sand on the on the bag includes live bacteria and what have you, and uh, it's, it's it's in fresh water. I I think if you taste the water in the bag of sand, it's not going to be salty. There's other ways to find that out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think it's fresh yeah. water inside the live bag. It's dormant also dormant bacteria. Dormant bacteria that's in the water. They tell you make sure to get the water in there, otherwise you won't add any of the bacteria. But doesn't replicate in salt water. Yeah, it's more of like a like a buffer, mm. you know, to like make sure it gives you a little bit of time to create the natural bacteria cycle in the tank. Uh, so live sand technically, I guess, has some live stuff in it, but not really quite what you think. Uh, nice and they, I don't think overly valuable. It would be nice if there's a, that comes out after the, the biome conversation starts and biome in a bottle, if you can now actually get uh, your sand and then your biome in a bottle. And like, just forget the marketing jargon of this being live sand and make sure you add all the water and blah, 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 blah. It's like, you, know, you need sand and you're going to need this little biome bottle. I don't know. Like, well, actually, that's kind of what uh, Aquaforest did, right? Mm -hmm. They have their dry sand, and then they give you the two little two bottles. Two little bacteria bottles, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so what else matters most? Uh, the clarifier bags in the live sand work. I've always thrown them away. And then Jen was like, no, they actually work. And then she was putting uh, some live. She did her first three videos were on live or on sand. And uh, in every one of them, she's like, use a clarifier, use a clarifier. And then I watched, uh, watched it happen, and it works. We actually had here uh, the HNSA that we built, and it was covered in that powder from uh, like uh, doing all, correcting all the, oh, yeah, correcting, yeah. covering the mistakes, right? And then the tank, we wanted to film it, but it wouldn't get uncloudy. Dirty. We even put on a, a big, huge canister sediment filters and stuff to filter out the water, 
and we just couldn't get the cloud out of it. And we're like, man, it's been days. You know, <laughs> we got a, like really elaborate filter on here. And we tore that little bag open and dumped it in. It was gone an hour. Yeah. It, uh, flocculent. The flocculent stuff. works. The little clarifier <laughs> bag in there works. Use it. So don't, yeah, don't throw those away. Keep them. Uh, we also believe that matters most is bare, ba bare bottom is best done with live rock or exceptionally patient people. Uh, the only reason I'm patient uh, enough is because uh, I can just, uh, I don't need to see corals in that. You know. It's not uh, right now, this, at this point, I don't, uh, it's not a rush to fill the tank up with corals. Mm -hmm. So I can be fine uh, having a tank that's only got rock in it and flow for, I think, I think it was a year and a half before I actually put my first coral in there, just because I didn't have time. But uh, plus I knew what to expect. My personal counsel, to anybody that asked me is uh, if you're going to do a bare bottom, find a source of live rock, forget the dry rock, or be exceptionally patient. <laughs> so like one of those two things. Understand what you're getting into. A sterile bare bottom tank is going to have issues that uh, a standard tank doesn't. So mm -hmm. find a way to get live rock and you'll probably have a much higher success rate less frustrating journey in the beginning. Except for it's hard to uh, aquascape wet live rock. So yeah, there's some, there's some trade-offs here and there. You're gonna find different trade-offs, but uh, I wouldn't personally do a bare bottom dry rock again, or I would do it, I would cycle, find a way to cycle that rock for a pretty prolonged period of time. Yeah, do your aquascape it, first, cycle it, then start setting up your tank. I'd figure out something, man. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we'll find out the biome in a bottle. We'll find out the answers from our experiments here, and maybe I'll change the trajectory of that conversation. But right now, as we uh, uh, know it, and in that spirit, what I believe matters most here is with bare bottoms that don't have sand in them, UV can help a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, until we, so much so that we finally decided to just install it 100% on the 750 XXL. Uh, uh, why would you not put a UV a UV sterilizer? Well, on it? and so here's the thing about the UV is it will definitely protect the fish when they're installed correctly. But and we talked about having two UVs at different points, oh, you know. Yeah. But now I've found that hey, let's just set it to protect the fish, which is a slower flow rate. And then if we ever need it to help uh, prevent some issues or set it up in the beginning to prevent some of these uh, bacterial or dino issues, or let's set it at the higher flow rate that mm. will solve that. And then once we're past that stage, let's set it up for the fish, you know, or you can, you can go back and forth instead of having two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes. So what are some hard lessons that we've had with uh, live sand? Uh, I haven't had this one personally, but you talk about it a lot, so you must have seen it happen. But the first hard lesson is a fallen pump. Pump you know, into the sand. I haven't actually experienced this one, but uh, uh, because I guess I use Vortex, and if a pump falls off, it's not running. It doesn't run you know, anymore. In a yeah. lot of cases. But, uh, I've seen this one, uh, my days on Reef Central a lot, when there were so many pumps that were reliant on oh. suction cups, like oh, the maxi yeah, jets yeah, were yeah, suction yeah. cups. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, carbon copies of the tunes that were suction cups. Yeah. There's, there were weak magnets and all that kind of stuff. The magnet get bumped and all of a sudden the pump aims down. It takes all that hydrogen sulfide or whatever that rotten egg smell is, all the nutrients, all the yellow, and it just blows it all up into the tank and does nothing good. Right? <laughs> just... uh, it can nuke a whole tank that way, especially if you had like a four inch sand bed and God knows what's down in there yeah. and it's all just immediately released into the tank, whole tank could be gone. Oof, that's yeah. not one I want to see. So, I saw it much more commonly on Reef Central than I've actually seen it in person. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that, I guess that's why I'm a good. Uh, I'm a, still a proponent for Vortec pumps. That's, that's all I've ever it used to. It but. doesn't happen. Yeah, that thing <laughs> falls off for whatever reason. It doesn't run anymore. They don't aim down. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting, actually. All right. So uh, another one. Hard lesson. Most people think that you could mix grades of sand to fill in spots, and I guess so. But how does it work? Ah, uh, you know, if you put, uh, it's like taking, what's the science experiment that you do in your, uh, in your kid and you like 
start with the, some big chunks uh, like golf balls and then you put marbles and then you put something else and then you f uh, pour sand in it and guess what? All the sand goes all the way past and down to the bottom. The same thing happens in, the, in your tank when you mix uh, sand sizes. Like, man, I want to stop, uh, I don't want my sand to buy. I really like the oolite, but I don't want it to blow around. So maybe I'll mix it with like some crushed coral and uh, that'll kind of hold, hold it together and piece it together. But what ends up happening is the sand, all that soft light sand blows to wherever it's going to go and you're left with big crushed coral or if you didn't mix the sand, then dead uh, bare bottom spots. Usually it's just going to be like, like it makes you with a crushed coral, and there'll just be like all the shells and stuff in the middle. Yeah, it looks like it looks like calcium reactor media on the bottom. One of the things I'll say though is that over time, uh, when you put sand in initially, it blows around the most. Once it starts to build like a biofilm on it, yeah, it, it tends to hold. stick to each other yeah. a little bit more and blow around less. That's true. And so when you mix it, it will separate less. Uh, when the sand bed is established than when you first poured it in. But in general, know at least what you're getting into. Because you might actually like all the little crushed coral bits and stuff better uh, mm. than you do a bare open. But this is one of the things to think about too, is if you can put things that kind of hold the sand in, like take some of those little aquascape structures that we talked about, the little mini habitats, and like if this, where the sand separates is in the center of the tank, well, put a couple of them kind of around there and see if you can block the flow oh, from, yeah. you know, stirring it all up out of that yeah. location. And you might find better uh, locations than just trying to mix all the sand up. You should know that you're getting into this with some cert with some sands that you choose. Like the, the ocean is direct. Uh, you're going to see the sand separation because it's not sifted to specific particle sizes. It's true. Mm. Next one. <laughs> uh, hard lesson is black sand, and I think we've harped on black sand in almost any, any time we talk about sand and sand choices. Uh, we did a buyer's guide on, on sand and said uh, black sand's really cool, uh, but it's just something that we constantly avoid. Sand mistakes video we talked about avoiding black sand. Uh, has more magnetic bits in it than any other sand, and I, I've seen some sands uh, like uh, I've seen some white sands have little chunks of magnetic bits that you can get onto your uh, glass cleaner or your um, algae scraper. Uh, but definitely the black sand stuff. You're gonna end up scraping your tank if you're using the soft side. Yeah, I, almost everybody uses a magnet cleaner these days, and so. Uh, if you use black sand, just throw the magnet cleaner in the trash. Yeah, don't use it. Because it will it will get pieces, uh, it's essentially volcanic material that's been ground up, you know, like by a mm. millennia in the sea, and it's filled with whatever came out of the ground. Uh, and so uh, it's not calcium carbonate. And so it will scratch, you'll get underneath in your magnet, it'll scratch your glass. Also, there's two kinds of it. There's really kind of finer grade stuff, which will turn over a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then there's big chunky stuff. Mm. The yeah. big chunky stuff was actually interesting to me for a minute because it, I was like, oh, I can put this black stuff down the bottom and it probably won't, uh, you know, like get blown all over the place. Uh, and I might uh, be willing to use a normal scraper for it. But the problem is it says because it's really pretty big, it doesn't move at all. No. Nah. It'll just turn purple. <laughs> Eventually, coralline. coralline algae just grows over it, and then you no longer have black sand, you have purple sand, and then you can mix it up, and now you have speckled black and purple sand. <laughs> so, black sand... Hides, hides <sighs> things well. Kind of interesting. Most people will be disappointed with yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Uh, next hard lesson is if you reuse the sand, uh, clean it or kill it. So... Taking sand out of the 160 re and thinking about reusing it somewhere else uh, should come on the heels of filling a, a five gallon buckets with it, rinsing it uh, with a garden hose forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and then uh, drying it, sifting it, and putting it back. Like taking scoops of sand, going straight to the other tank is probably a bad idea. Yeah, if you're gonna reuse sand, meaning you're gonna move your tank from one location to another location or use the sand somewhere else, like do not do that without mm. cleaning it. And yes, you're going, when you clean it, you're going to destroy the uh, biome that lives on that sand, but it's so much better than polluting the tank with all of the garbage that's in there. Uh, we did that in one of the experience, uh, experiment tanks here and it killed both the clownfish immediately. 
Uh, whatever was in that sand when you stirred it up uh, was mm. terrible to the point that it was immediately toxic to those two fish. Yeah. Uh, once we uh, let it settle out again, and all of a sudden uh, it was fine. But like under no circumstances would I ever reuse sand without cleaning it. Somebody may have somehow threaded the gauntlet out there and give the advice that you could. Anybody that uh, uh, I wanted to give good, sound, high percentage success advice to, I would go clean the sand. I mean, sand is all used. It all came out of the ocean. <laughs> it was all used at some point in time, but it was cleaned yeah. uh, at many times. It was sifted, and it doesn't have the same things that, uh, in this case, uh, it's not a new big nutrient sink in the tank. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So what's next? We're on episode 13 of the 52 Weeks of Reefing. This one was called Ammonia. Not as simple as you think. The ideal tank cycle. And our core belief here. Mm -hmm. Core belief on ammonia. Is it matters? Then it doesn't. Except when it does. <laughs> uh, you know, ammonia is such a goofy thing here. There's like a couple of different pieces. Like it does matter in the beginning, uh -huh. right? Uh, you have, especially you're using live rock, a lot of organics on it. It's a going spike. to spike. Yeah. Uh, Toxic to fish. And then if you bought an ammonia test kit, you'll probably never use it again. Yep. And Once you'll never cycle, think about well, it again. Except for like, there are a couple of reasons when, you know, you might see ammonia be a problem in your tank. Mm. One might be uh, I have chloramines in my water and I'm dosing ammonia gas to uh, my freshly mixed salt water or my auto top off water. Mm. Ammonia in that case really matters. Yeah. Uh, it might also be why a lot of people don't use canister filters and sand filters and things like that because in those cases, like with live rock, you know, the power edge goes out or whatever, nobody cares. Yeah. Like you turn it back on, all the ammonia and the filtration in your tank still lives. Mm -hmm. With uh, something like a, a bio ball or, you know, like a bio ball is if the power goes out, well, the trickle stops, the plastic dries out, and your entire filter Everything is dies. done, right? Yeah. But all the organics in the tank have not stopped producing ammonia, and so when the power comes back on, everything dies. It breaks down yeah, and dies. Same thing with the sand. When the, sta the sand filters stop uh, tumbling, well, all of a sudden, uh, you get a lack of oxygen, everything dies, and it doesn't work again. Same thing with like canister filters, same mm. with like, all these things. There's some things like those uh, ceramic medias that tend to stay moist for a long time. They're less of an issue, but uh, in general, it matters that it doesn't, except for when it does. So what do we believe <laughs> matters most? First one we believe matters most about ammonia is that live rock is better than a filter because rock doesn't break. So that's exactly what that, you said. That's that canister filter analogy, everything. It doesn't break. You can't really break a live rock filter. Yeah. In fact, when I first- I mean, you'd have to, dra the tank would have to be drained, dried for a long period of time, then refilled back up and started all over again. Well, that just doesn't happen. Like you'd a have to power like outage. bleach in the tank almost. <laughs> uh, Actually, when I first asked, uh, uh, there's a, a, fat, a fish uh, store, local fish store here called Sea Level, and I went in there and that was the first place I ever asked about a fish uh, saltwater tank. And they said, you know what, often saltwater is actually easier than freshwater mm. because there is- The filters? There isn't any filter here. Yeah. You don't have an under gravel filter, you don't have any of that stuff. The rock actually filters the tank for you. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I would have never thought that it was easier. Yeah. Uh, and for fish only, he might be right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, so what matters most? Uh, cycle is more about live rock than dry rock. Ah, this is that uh, biome conversation that we're starting to explore a little more too. Is uh, you, know, you know, when is your cycle complete is the ultimate question. And I think a hundred different ways or a hundred ways from Sunday everybody would ask, uh, answer when there's no more ammonia mm -hmm. and there's no registered nitrates. And I think the inverse too is also true, which is that live rock comes with so much more organics that you're going to have a bigger ammonia spike and the dry rock has no organics on it. So you won't have the ammonia spike. And the only ammonia spike with that case would come from whatever fish you put in there and tiny amount of food, which is probably minuscule in comparison to all mm -hmm. the organics that come on live rock. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the nitrogen cycle in ammonia is a lot more important to pay attention to with live rock than dry because of that. That'll be interesting to test. Mm -hmm. um, it's plausible. Uh, all right. 
What also we believe matters most is bacteria in a bottle almost certainly works, but some better than others. Now we started this test, uh, got some results, and then uh, kind of threw it in the trash. You know, we were testing different bacterial supplements, different cycling methods and approaches. I haven't looked at the data myself yet to see what came of it, but that's uh, the one where they was... all didn't have any because we used dry rock, yeah. and they didn't have any ammonia yeah. spike. Even yeah. the sample one, even with eight fish in it, yeah. right? And even using the Hawk, like a three thousand dollar machine plus hobby test kits, couldn't Not find it. Not tested. It was that was the, the the surprise. Yeah. You know, and so if we used live rock, we'd probably have a different result. Mm. Uh, but bacteria in a bottle almost certainly works. The the difference though is. You know, storage, does a bacteria like have a problem with heat? Does it have a problem with freezing? And some, some of the bacteria in those bottles don't replicate in salt water, so you kind of get like a one-time dose of it. Uh, some have heterotrophic bacteria in there that do something else. And You know, the problem with it too is like, even if you got it at like your fish store, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I didn't get it frozen like I did if I, you know, bought it from bulk resupply in February, uh, <laughs> you know. But it still crossed the nation in February mm -hmm. uh, and landed somewhere. It just got thawed when you bought it off the shelf because it had to get there somehow, Yeah. right? <laughs> and actually, in many cases, hot is just as bad or even worse than freezing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if it's on the back of a truck and it's uh, 180 or 130 degrees inside the back of the semi, you know, baking in the sun for that whole trip, well, yeah. Uh, it may have some problems as well. So, you know, a lot of these things, when you look at the different ones, think about, you know, where you got it from, did it go, did it get too cold, did it get too hot? It, do they specifically say on the bottle that, you know, heat or uh, cold don't matter? And if you had to buy it in a fridge, that it was temperature controlled at the store to mm. uh, maintain the quality, the chances that it was shipped in a refrigerated uh, truck to get there? Pretty low. I call near zero, uh, just knowing what happens it, in our industry. It's not human food. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because nothing else in that shipment that came from that facility uh, also had to have that same level of care, so probably not. Yeah. It'd be interesting as we explore the biome conversation and we come up with maybe you know, the, an idea of what a good or fully diverse biome looks like. Uh, and how that compares to what's in some of these actual bottles. I, I highly doubt that uh, you can get, you know, you can't get all, there's bacteria that travel well, there's bacteria that can be bottled well, there's bacteria that you can, uh, maybe you can't even culture and put in a bottle that uh, might benefit your, your cycle. Uh, so the future of the, the bacteria bottles and, and how you get them, how you source them, what's in them and stuff like that might, might change. You know, I'll tell you, actually, there's some of them I just happen to know. Uh, like uh, the bacteria in the bottle that come from KZ. I know what that one did because uh, that one shipped it here via air. Hmm. You know, so we should put that stuff on a plane from Germany and get it here. So I know the transport of that one. Uh, but a lot of them you just won't really know. Okay, so what else uh, about... Uh, uh, what else do we believe matters most? Uh, next one here is, can I buy, you can, you can buy a test kit or you can just wait until nitrate starts to show up. So you can waste your 10 bucks or eight bucks or whatever to, uh, an ammonia test kit come, uh, costs. Uh, you can waste another eight to $10 on a nitrite test kit, or you can just buy the nitrate test kit that you're going to use anyway and uh, let your tank run until you start to measure something on there. Uh, I probably would never buy an ammonia test kit. Uh, I just give it some time. <laughs> I have experience tells me I can just wait some time, and if I starting to see nitrate or nitrate in my test kit, mm. the cycle is probably. I don't know how way. many times I've tested for nitrite and never never seen it. And the first tank like, I ever owned, I, I wanted to test every stage of the cycle. Yeah, like a lot well, of people totally are told. Yeah. And then that test kit just goes in the trash. It'll, <laughs> it'll expire by the time you need to use it again. Uh, okay, so another uh, thing that matters most is ammonia gas in your water supply is probably the number one concern about ammonia. No, after the fact, huh? after yeah. the cycle. Yeah. yeah, so after you cycle your tank, if you're worried about ammonia, it's probably the number one source will be 
50% of you have chloramines in your water, which is chlorine mixed ammonia when mm -hmm. you split it up. If you do it bad, I have a, like a poor carbon block, you'll end up with ammonia gas in your water. If it smells like ammonia, that means there's ammonia in the yeah. water for sure. Mm. And is there a way to solve for it? Uh, pro Series. Those pro Series resins, yeah. And the right carbon blocks up front. Yeah, So that's, that's about it. All right. Uh, uh, you, we also believe that matters most is you don't uh, don't more than double the fish inches in a week. Uh, these uh, the fish, you know, they breathe and when or they respirate, and when they respirate, they produce ammonia. And uh, if you add a whole ton of fish at once, all of a sudden to your cool. tank, uh, was the bacterial population or was the biome in the in the tank ready to handle that influx of ammonia? Uh, probably not. It's a, not only that, but it's the food you're going to have, yeah. too, along with it. So, uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't double. And we said, you should say kind of double the amount of fish, but it's kind of inches, you know. So yeah, I mean, like, if I could put two big giant fish in there and uh, I'm just as screwed. <laughs> these are just rough guidelines. Uh, yeah. If somebody is asking me, uh, don't put 50 fish in all at once, yeah. you know, in an unestablished tank. <laughs> uh, uh, also, for if you're going to buy a test kit, probably the little sea camel arm is really little, popular. Little tiny wheel guy that uh, you can st uh, suction cups inside. And it tells you, hey, toxic, uh, 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 toxic amount of ammonia, or not so bad. Yeah, it's uh, super I would probably easy. buy that before I buy a test kit because I don't want to perform the test kit. I can just walk up and see it. Yeah, uh, uh, visual indication. All right, uh. hard lessons from ammonia. <laughs> Uh, the first hard lessons that we learned about ammonia is that the Senai uh, wasn't useful, wasn't that useful. Uh, the Senai has the ammonia monitoring built into it. You have the little, you know, 30-day tabs that you can stick in. Uh, and we actually built out uh, a testing apparatus or uh, that we got this big giant Senai hub that had like a dozen or so Senais attached to it that we could, all of them uh, connected to the internet so we can monitor. And we, the thought process was is we would monitor, monitor ammonia in real time. Uh, so when we did these cycle tests in the 12 different tanks, you could actually like pull up some numbers and charts and see like the um, process of ammonia throughout the day and throughout the extent of the test. Uh, you went and tried that at home and found out that that does not actually work. I don't know, it's not that it didn't work. It just give, didn't give me the readings into the range that I wanted mm. in. And the little tabs expire every single month and I have to replace them. And I'm not the kind of person that replaces things on time yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, and the problem is, is like a pH probe, I know full well the value of the pH probe, what it's doing for me. Uh, and so I replace it, the little tab in there. I guess mm. it also monitors pH, but it's done in 30 days. I I don't know, you know. I, I get that ammonia is monitoring. The only thing in the tank that will actually tell you stuff is dying because ammonia is happening. Yeah. But I don't think most people would use this tool that way. And they no, found that it was less than less than ideal <laughs> at actually doing it. So I don't know, that was just for me. Other people might feel differently. I mean, it does uh, water level sensor, temperature, and you know, it has, uh, um, uh, par meter kind of built uh, built into it too, so there's, it's a useful tool in other aspects. Maybe just not this one. All right, uh, another hard lesson we already said was nitrite test kit worthless. Don't buy one. Stop, uh, stop it'll buying just them. expire. There's no need for it. Just <laughs> measure the nitrate when it starts showing up. You're probably good. Yeah. Uh, the other hard lesson I had on the 360 was the fishless cycle. I decided for the first time to just do ghost dose ammonia. Mm. And, you know, you ghost dose ammonia to like one part per million, and it actually causes the cycle to take way longer than if you had just slowly built up the ammonia. Uh. The ammonia, like actually those uh, bacteria take a while to actually process all of that, and it does it slower when there's that much ammonia in there. Yeah, a, uh, a steady rate. And then I, I forget the conversion, but I think one part per million ammonia turns into like four yeah. parts per million nitrate in the end. Somebody will correct me on that one, but it's more than one. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, well, why would you want to start a tank this way? Yeah. I, I didn't get it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, there's got to be a, probably a better way. I, if I did it again, I wouldn't immediately bring it up to uh, one part per million. Mm. I would bring it up to like, I don't know a tenth of a part per million or even less and I would slowly dose it in the same, like essentially the same rate that throwing two fish or a little bit of food in there would do. But to be honest, 
Uh, it's like dumping a year's supply of food uh, on your head at once. And you're like, all right, let's see how long it takes you to get through this. I don't know, <laughs> especially with the dry rock thing. Man, I just have never had a problem with losing fish uh, up front. Mm. So uh, I just, I would not do that. Yeah. I just buy the, the, uh, or the bacteria booster and uh, call it a day. The fishless cycle, just, I don't lose fish that way. So I just wouldn't. I wouldn't be concerned about it. I wouldn't do it. It wasn't <laughs> worth it for me. Uh, that hits on the ammonia turns to nitrate as well. Uh, yeah, because a hard lesson learned is ammonia turns to nitrate. So, and I mean, it goes back to exactly what we said is uh, what we believe matters most. Uh, just buy a nitrate kit and wait for it to get there. But uh, actually, you know, no, interesting is like that refugium and when you start the refugium because uh, hmm. uh, it's going to process... Uh, It'll, it'll probably process ammonia first. It'll like seek out ammonia and, and sucking up ammonia before it gets to nitrate too. But uh, so does that mean you inhibit your cycle because you try to start your refugium first because it's now now that's taking the ammonia rather than bacteria and is it Might. still safe? I don't know. It's hard to say. Ah. Yeah. Another hard lesson is pH affects ammonia in a fish bag. Okay, so in the, the fish bag when this you is, buy, I, yeah, actually I asked you. I was like pH. You're like, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah. So when you're in a, uh, when you buy a fish, it's specially online, and mm -hmm. then you get it delivered, it's been thrown around by FedEx for a day, and it's in here. It's usually water that has a, a chlorine, or a, like a, a copper in it, mm -hmm. and whatnot. but if you get ammonia in there, what happens is uh, the fish is breathing all this carbon dioxide into the bottle, or into the bag, and there is ammonia building up in that bag. And uh, what happens is it's not toxic because at a low pH, the ammonia is actually ammonium. Interesting. Right? Uh, however, once you start doing your uh, like a uh, trickle, um, you know, open the bag, uh, acclimate, and whatever, yeah. and you get gas in there, all of a sudden the pH rises, the ammonium turns into ammonia gas, which is super toxic, toxic to the fish and really bad for them. So uh, one of the things you can think about is like, you know, doing an accelerated uh, uh, acclimation, acclimation. Mm -hmm. like don't make it th take three hours because you <laughs> might actually be doing more harm than yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, like ask who you're getting this from. So like Elliot at Marine Collectors, I was talking to him about this and he's like, yeah, most of the places you buy online will ship it to you in water that came from the systems, which means it's filled with copper and stuff. And they can't put, in most cases, the ammonia like detoxifier in there because those things will become toxic together, oh, okay. right? And so in his case, what he does is he uses brand new fresh or salt water that doesn't have copper or any medications in it. And then he puts the ammonia detoxifier in the bag so that even when you start to do your acclimation, when you get it to your house Still and the pH rises it. up, the detoxifier yeah. will make sure the ammonia isn't uh, mm. having that problem. So that's like one of those things of getting healthy pets from somebody who actually takes care who of Who knows what they're than, doing? Yeah, <laughs> rather than the cheapest possible source of I, I don't pets. Know. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so what's next? Well, tomorrow we start with episode 14, and I believe we're going from 14 through 17 tomorrow. Uh, and same thing, we're gonna, you know, we're actually gonna break these up in chunks, so you get to enjoy them individually because they're about hour-long sessions apiece. And, mm -hmm. uh, there you go. All right, we'll see you guys tomorrow at noon with episode 14 plus. <laughs>